Dear audience and uh, participants, I welcome you all. Uh, today is the 8th of April. It's my birthday also today. <laughs> oh. uh, Every uh, birthday. <laughs> and, uh, my name is uh, Oğuz Tekin and I'm uh, the director of ACMET. Uh, I'm uh, connecting with you from uh, Antalya, where ACMET is uh, located. Uh, approximately three hours away uh, from Antioquia. And I'm very pleased to welcome you at this uh, online event. And uh, the title of this event is Antioquia at uh, Kragum, uh, at Kragum in rough uh, Silesia. So uh, located in Gazi Pasha in the southern part of Turkey, the site is uh, really amazing uh, with its uh, nice uh, harbor. I, I just, I've just looked at uh, the website of Antioquia excavation a few minutes ago also. So today uh, we will listen to the uh, team members who will uh, tell us uh, the site in detail. So um, they will make uh, a power, some PowerPoint presentations, including many images, I think, relating to, to the site. So if we get uh, permission to put this uh, recorded event uh, on our uh, YouTube channel, or on our ACMES YouTube channel, I mean, uh, it will be accessible, will be watched uh, by a much larger um, audience. Of course, we will wait uh, for um, per permission from, uh, from the excavation director for this. And after uh, this um, short introduction, on behalf uh, of uh, Ahmed, I would like to thank uh, Michael Hoff, the head of the excavation, and uh, all my colleagues uh, who will make their uh, presentations, and Asena, Asena Hanım, uh, who will act as the uh, moderator. And I would also like to thank Tarkan Kahya and Emrullah Can from the Ahmed team for their uh, efforts um, in uh, realization of uh, this event. So now, um, after these words, uh, I want to leave the floor to Ms. Uh, Asena, uh, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Tekin. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Koch University, Ahmed, Professor Oz Tekin, Tarkan Kahya, and Amullah Chan, who invited us and contributed to preparation of this precious uh, program. Uh, in 2005, excavation began at the Roman era city of Antioquia at Kragum in Western Rough Cilicia. Although scholarly interest towards the past hundred years in the region was somewhat abundant. Mostly it was confined to survey and epigraphical studies. The survey which first started in the region under the director of the professor Nicolas Rao gained a different dimension when the professors from the team members decided to excavate and took it Kragum. It's uh, Michael Hoff, of course, Rice Thompson and uh, Tim Ho. Uh, this workshop offers glimpses into some of the various research programs ongoing in the city. We hope that you will enjoy the day and come away with an understanding and appreciation, uh, appreciation for the work that is being carried out. We can start our program, the first guest, Professor Townsend. Uh, I would like also like to give a brief information about the professor. Professor Thompson has conducted field work in Greece, Turkey, Italy, and Cyprus, both on the land and underwater. From 1996 to 2004, he directed the architectural component on the rough Cilicia survey project, an archaeological survey of more than 100 square kilometers on Turkey's southern shore, recording thousands of the sites that had never been mapped previously. Since 2005, he has turned his attention to the excavation and reconstruction of the Roman temple at the one of the these sites, Antioquia at Kragum. Professor Thousand recently retired from Clark University, where he had taught Greek and the Roman archaeology for 40 years. 
Yes, Professor Thousand, and uh, I love the floor to you, uh, and uh, you can start to thank you so much. Thank you, Asana, and thank you everyone for uh, putting this uh, workshop together. It's it's exciting to see everybody in the off season. I'm going to uh, give you an overview of the work on the temple, and I'll get right underway. So I'll start by sharing my screen. Can you all see that? Yeah. I'm trying to get it into full. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, I suppose it's in some ways appropriate that I begin this uh, workshop because it is on the temple that the um, excavation project began back in 2005, where we uh, were given permission to uh, clear the temple and eventually to excavate and um, reconstruct uh, what we can. There are two kinds of reconstruction, as you all know, but, uh, on paper and, and physically. I'm going to today focus on uh, the reconstruction on paper, which is, of course, preliminary to any uh, anastelosis. The temple uh, is located here. I want to show you this aerial view so that you can get an idea of its relationship to the rest of the site, some of which we'll be talking about later. This is the way the Temple Mound looked when uh, we began in 2005, with just a, a few blocks uh, peeping out and uh, largely covered with this maquis, terrible uh, shrubs that uh, grow in the area. The first step, therefore, was to clear off that vegetation. And th this is what was uh, revealed um, in the season of 2006. The first step was to uh, survey each and every one of the visible blocks so that we knew its position exactly on the mound. And um, Michael Hoff uh, led that work. Uh, it, simultaneously with that, however, oh, um, excuse me, here is a, uh, a slide showing the a preliminary plan of the blocks uh, in their original, or in their position on the mound. They're color coded for the different types of architectural members. So I started to say that uh, simultaneous with that uh, survey work of the blocks, we began to move the blocks uh, from the mound to a series of block fields, um, making use of this uh, truck mounted uh, crane. Uh, it was quite uh, an undertaking at first as we got used to uh, just how we could do this, but eventually, a very smooth operation uh, came into effect. And I'm very proud and pleased to say that we uh, damaged not a single block in this, uh, in this process. A third activity was going on, surveying, moving, but before moving uh, a block from the Temple Mound, its exposed surface, for instance, this one right here, would be uh, drawn by, uh, by students to uh, uh, describe graphically the features of one side of the block, the upper side. Over the course of the next several seasons, this process continued so that by the end of the 2011 season, this is what the area looked like. The temple uh, now cleared and well over 600 blocks distributed uh, in, these, uh, in these fields. What you see here is a view of, of what was left, what was exposed after all the blocks were removed. And I think you can see very easily that the temple was uh, in really ruinous condition. 
The front of the temple had completely slid down the slope here. It's a podium temple, which I'll show you in a second, but the podium on the side and on the other side was uh, poorly preserved. It was only at the rear that the podium was well preserved. And I'm, I'm very glad it was because uh, it helped tremendously in the reconstruction. Now, the other purpose of this slide is to show you um, what had to be done to the blocks after they were moved uh, to the block fields. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, one side had already been drawn. That side what became the side that faced down to the ground. Uh, students from Clark University then uh, drew the other five sides of the block in a fashion that you can see here. Um, some of you may be wondering why we use this, uh, this technique, because uh, today uh, you would use something quite different. Uh, you would use um, digital photogrammetry. But uh, that, uh, that technique was just beginning to come into uh, usage when we began the project. And um, so uh, it wasn't feasible, it was expensive, and I'll be quite honest with you, I had not uh, grown up uh, learning it. So we uh, all used this traditional method of hand drawing uh, according to scale uh, the various blocks and using a technique whereby they're folded out to show the uh, individual sides in relationship to each other. It's as effective as digital work, but not nearly as, as quick. I'm going to leap ahead and, and show you what uh, all the work uh, did uh, or produced uh, from these drawings and the efforts uh, to put them all together. Uh, so keep this in mind right now, this, this ruinous view here. And then I switch to this uh, slide, which shows uh, in quite accurate uh, fashion, uh, the temple as it was originally constructed. It's you might say a, a leap of faith to go from that um, flat uh, crumble uh, to this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Now I want to show you a, a little bit of just how this was uh, accomplished. Um, and so I'm going to give you a few details of how we came up with uh, certain measurements and dimensions, and also show you some, uh, I think, surprising aspects of the temple. Uh, first of all, though, let me just briefly describe it. It's what's called a tetra-style, pro-style temple. That's to say there are four columns across the front, and these columns stand in front of or before uh, the cella uh, proper. It is, as I mentioned before, a podium temple it stands up on a, uh, this uh, raised platform. Uh, it is Corinthian in order, and it is built according to Greek architectural uh, methods of clamps and dowels without uh, any mortar at all. Let me amend that by saying there's no mortar in the superstructure. Uh, the Podium consists of a concrete core, which is uh, uh, faced with a veneer of, of marble, and then the temple superstructure, uh, all in traditional dry masonry technique. On the one hand, we had a tremendous number of, of uh, architectural members. Uh, this slide shows you a selection of them. And um, they were extremely important, of course, in reconstructing the uh, superstructure, particularly the entablature. Uh, here's an architrave block, which I'll actually refer to again later, uh, a frieze block, which was joined uh, with dentals. Uh, this is the best preserved of the, uh, of the Corinthian uh, column capitals. Uh, this massive block here is a geison or a cornice block uh, turned up upside down as it um, appears in this photograph. And so these uh, all uh, help give us an idea of the 
of the form of the, of the entablature. There are also many column fragments, but uh, they were just that, they were very fragmentary and try as we might, we could not uh, with any accuracy reconstruct the height of the column. This was very disappointing because of course, without the height of the column, you can't get the height of the temple. Uh, after much agonizing, I found a way to do that, however. Going to the back of the temple, to the two corners at the back, I discovered a series of blocks that belong to the pilasters, the articulated corners of, of the block, and uh, saw that they fit together in a system, uh, which is shown by this slide here. This shows you the full uh, pilaster uh, in, in height. That's quite small, and I suppose you can't see any detail. Uh, you, this uh, slide over here shows the uh, the lower half of it, and you can see better uh, what is going on. Basically, they took blocks, and uh, one went uh, in this direction, the next one went in this direction, uh, but not always. Here's one that goes in the, both directions at the same time, um, and then we pick up that pattern again. The blocks were also, some of them, uh, very fragmentary, and that's indicated by the dotted lines in the, in the drawing here. But most uh, maddening was the fact that not all of the blocks actually even looked like pilaster blocks. Let me tell you, show you what I mean. This is a, a detail of a typical pilaster block, and you can see right here this articulated edge at the very corner of the temple. This is, of course, a uh, design uh, element which purposely uh, emphasizes the architectural uh, importance of the corner of a building. And this um, here is a view of that block itself. You can see quite clearly these notches, they're called rebates, which uh, form uh, the shape of the um, of the block. And so it would stand at the corner, it would go out this way along the flank, and this way along the rear of the temple itself. However, there were also uh, blocks which seemed to not belong uh, because they had these rebates on only one side. I'm sorry you can't see this very well, but it's articulated by this uh, blue corner. And you can see it here in the drawing. So I, it seemed like this would belong to the pilaster, but on the other side, there's nothing. It's a complete flat surface. Uh, and uh, it has what is called anatherosis. For those of you not familiar with architectural terminology, this is the preparation of a surface for an adjoining block. Uh, in the drawing, it's represented right here. I could not figure out for the life of me how these blocks worked until, I don't know how it came to me, but one day I realized that in order to create this shape of the rebate, the block along the rear of the temple was simply set in slightly from the edge of the block on this side with the anatherosis. And that would create uh, the uh, image of the of the of the rebate of the indented corner. Once that was figured out, I was able to uh, continue all the way up to the top, and uh, each pilaster uh, had eleven blocks in it, and uh, it was I, I worked on the right rear first, and then I went to the left rear and found out that it too had exactly eleven blocks, which of course it should have. So these two facts uh, uh, corroborated each other, and uh, we were then able to calculate the height of the pilaster. And of course, the height of the pilaster is the same as the height of the columns. Okay, um, so we have uh, the elevation of the temple. Turning to its uh, ground plan, 
uh, is where more complicated difficulties arose. And <clears throat> this, is, this is ironical because uh, there's actually a great deal more evidence uh, for the width of the temple than there is for the um, for any other part of it. But let me let me uh, begin by describing. So we have the uh, the back wall here, which you can see in this slide. Uh, we have the threshold block leading into the cella, which you can see here. We have a few isolated blocks of the stylobate, the uppermost uh, step. And very fortunately, we have the bottom step, which you can see down here. With that, um, we could get so far, and also, pardon me, the width of the podium, which is an important aspect, which helps to uh, add to the dimensions of the width. So with that, we could get uh, this far in the reconstruction, all the way up uh, to the threshold block. Here's the back wall, the podium, and so forth. The next thing to do was to try to figure out what is the projection of these blocks called the anti. And here again, the builders um, didn't make things easy because they used different types of block to form the, the anti or antas. Uh, however, one type was extremely diagnostic and important because it was cut as you can see here, here's the projecting part of the anta. Here is the um, block itself set in. And then as the drawing shows, it is cut on an angle here, which you can see here in the slide. And that is where the door wall of the cella uh, joined. Given that, we could uh, determine that the projection of the anta was 37 centimeters. The, what's called the offset, is not preserved on this a particular block, but it's uh, roughly from other blocks, 64 centimeters. With that, we get out to here in the plan. Uh, the last step then is to figure out where the columns uh, were positioned in relationship to the cella itself. And, and this block uh, uh, gave us that information. It was, thank goodness we have it because it would be difficult uh, to figure it out uh, otherwise. Uh, and it's uh, a meter 90. So we now get ourselves out to here. Um, we also, by the way, I'm not going to show you, but we also have column bases, which confirm um, the measurement of that particular member. We get out to here, and then what is remaining to do is simply calculate the number of steps uh, down to that bottom step. So the length of the temple, I'm very certain about. However, it's the width that where things get, get tricky. The, this is the rear of the temple uh, while it was being excavated. And uh, we have the full width of the podium, 10 meters 85. We know that the cella wall was set in uh, two meters and one centimeter. And symmetry demands that it be set in on the sides uh, the same amount. Well, if you have a 10 meter, 10.85 meter wide uh, podium and the side set in 4.02 meters, what you come up with at a width of the cell wall at the back is 6.83. Turning now to the front of the temple, uh, something very odd happens. Again, we have very secure evidence for the measurement here. The most famous block of the temple being the, the pediment block in the center. Uh, this is the, a corner, massive corner Geisen block. It's shown upside down in the slide, which is right here. Uh, and we also have its mate on the other side. So the measurement at the front is very, very well known. Uh, you put those blocks together, then you calculate how far uh, the architrave is set in from them. Again, we know that precisely because we have the blocks themselves. And lo and behold, the figure is 6.25. So from 6.83 for the width of the wall at the back, we come to 6.25 for the width of the wall at the front. What happened? 
here's the slide to show you 6.83 and 6.25. And that is why if you were looking carefully at the drawing, you'll see that these walls are canted inward in order to accommodate that, that difference. I can only figure out that the uh, builders of this temple made a, a, a big blunder. Uh, and I have evidence to, to, to show uh, how that blunder occurred and what they did uh, to, uh, to, to, to fix it to the extent that they could. Here are the undersides of all of the uh, blocks, the architrave blocks of the porch. And you can see they're very well uh, decorated. Um, and uh, to show uh, decoration on the exposed underside of sometimes called a soffit. Uh, this is the one block that is not fully preserved. Uh, and it is the center architrave block uh, and it's about a half preserved. So it's the only one that we don't have any, uh, we don't know the full dimension of, but it would have been um, similar uh, to the others. Well, here's where the difficulty arose. Using the intercolumniation of 1.90, which if you remember, we have from this block on the return, the builders came into difficulty in uh, the positioning of these soffit underside decorations. What you're looking at here, it's kind of a weird drawing, but you're looking up through the column shaft to the upper column diameter. And then you're looking up beyond that to the projection of the capital itself. Sorry, I know I'm out of time, but this won't be uh, too much longer. So the column diameter, the projection of the uh, decoration of the capital. Uh, once again, this is the best preserved. And then above that is uh, where the architrave block, looking at the underside, rests on it. And if you look carefully, you'll see that the decoration comes into contact and overlaps with uh, the, uh, the projection of the column capital. It does it in almost every instance uh, in this instance, it's particularly revealing because they tried to do something about it. Uh, you can see that they started to make the decoration here, and then they started to make it here, and they finally ended up making it here, moving it in this direction enough so that it would barely clear the decoration of the column capital. This clearly shows a, a mistake and uh, a change in plan. I feel that what I think happened is that the intercolumniation was supposed to be wider, but um, for whatever reason, maybe because of the pediment block, they had to narrow it. And therefore the, there had to be some uh, accommodation made. Uh, you might say, well, what, they would have done the soffit decoration later, but that's not the case, I think. They would have done it very early because it was detailed and would have taken a long time. And when they realized their mistake, it was too late. You can also see that uh, here's the center of the column. The block does not um, go to the center. It goes farther. It shouldn't do that. It's even more radical over here. This is where this block should end, but instead it goes all the way out to here and leaving only a little bit for this block, AT148, to uh, balance on, on, the, um, on the column capital. There are other aspects of mistakes like this in, in the temple, but it does show uh, the hurried uh, nature of it. One final comment to make uh, is the type of material. Uh, it's often been said that rough silicia does not have any marble, but <clears throat> this is disproved by the temple at Antiochia ad Kragum. Uh, it is a uh, highly calcite rich uh, marble. Uh, this has been determined by my colleague, Ej Erdemus in her lab, uh, engineering lab. 
And it also matches the marble in a local quarry, maybe five kilometers uh, from the temple itself. Uh, this is a screenshot from uh, the website of the quarry. Here is a photograph of uh, the um, block blocks uh, in the process of being cut. And here's a comparison of those uh, modern blocks to the ancient blocks. And you can see the similarity. I'll just show you three uh, to give you an idea. So the, I, I guess the final um, point I wanna make is that uh, this temple shows a lot of interesting aspects as you delve into the, uh, the details of it. And I know that there are more uh, yet to be revealed, uh, which is why I keep coming back uh, every year. And that's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Thousand. It's the temple is one of the most monumental structures in the city, and uh, your work is very beneficial for both the city and uh, also for the region. Uh, thank you. Uh, very much uh, uh, for both your presentation and precious uh, work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sena. Uh, okay, now the second uh, colleague speaker is, is Professor Rodriguez, is currently a visiting assistant professor of archaeology in the Department of Classical at Trinity University, San Antonio, Texas. She joined to Antioch at Kragum team, team in uh, uh, 219. Uh, and uh, has supervised the excavation of small bath since 2000, sorry, uh, 20. Prior to this, she worked on survey and excavation at sites in Greece. Okay, Leticia. Okay, you can start. Yeah, turn on, I to turn on my mic, sorry. Let me go ahead and share my, my screen here. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, yes. Okay, right. excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you again to, to Ahmed, our organizers, as well as uh, Asena. <laughs> thank you for, <laughs> for leading the, the webinar for us, for being our, our host. Um, so what I'll do right now, uh, well, in this short talk is really just a, an informal talk that gives you an introduction to the small bath at Antioquia at Pragum. Um, where excavations began in 2018. Um, so just as a general view, here we have the, the bath, and you may have noticed that I changed the title of the talk. Um, I think my initial title was part of my frustrations and kind of throwing my hands up in the air, of kind of what is this place? <laughs> is this a bath or what? What's going on here? Um, and so some of the things that I'll, I'll talk about uh, will maybe give you a sense of why I was feeling uh, this way. Um, so let me just move forward. Uh, so here we have the bath. Uh, Rice was just talking about the Northeast Temple up here. The small bath is immediately uh, south of that on the eastern end of the city. And you can see that it is just above the, the main road uh, that would lead into the city because as someone would come in through the city, they would come in along this main coastal road and presumably pass the small bath on their way. It was kind of hard to miss. And so here's a nice view from the monumental gate looking out toward the small bath here. Um, and I'll just make a point that this here is an older plan. Um, and I'm about to show you a newer plan that gives you a preview of uh, kind of what we did all last season. Um, so the bath itself, uh, well, first, let me rewind. Uh, one of the reasons that we started excavating here at the small bath, and uh, here we have the great bath, which I think we all know very well. Uh, one of the reasons we started excavating here at the small bath was to get, um, to understand the general structure and use of this particular kind of bath. Uh, which is a hall bath, as we can see from the plan, uh, the hall bath being a term coined by Yegu, uh, where we have a central hall, right? Uh, and a bank of rooms on either side, in this case, the north and the south here. Uh, and this kind of bath we've seen in other parts of rough Cilicia, uh, in Anemorium, that's probably one of the better preserved ones, but also Siedra, uh, but also in Eastern Pamphylia. 
Um, so our bath, as you can see, as I said, I'm giving you a preview uh, as to the work that we've done up to this point. Um, but what I'm going to do is just go through some images uh, and really just kind of take us year by year as to the work that we have accomplished at the small bath uh, and some of the interesting finds um, that continue to, to puzzle us that have posed a series of questions for us uh, season after season. So as I mentioned, excavations at the bath began in 2018. Uh, and these uh, were pretty uh, focused on Frigidarium 1 and the hall here. Uh, I've tried to designate these on the plan for you. So Frigidarium 1 here, uh, here is the portion of the hall that was excavated in 2018. Uh, you can see the extent to which, uh, you know, we had to deal with <laughs> lots of fill. Um, there was a lot of dirt removed, lots of stones uh, every season, in fact. Um, and you can see uh, what we were able to accomplish. I say we, although I was not there in 2018. Um, but, oh, excuse me. Sorry, this is jumping ahead for some reason. There we go. I'm trying to make this smaller. Okay, apologies. Um, so interesting finds from Frigidarium 1 uh, included this geometric mosaic, right, uh, as well as some marble revetments preserved uh, along the base of the, the wall here in the back. Uh, but perhaps the most interesting, of course, is the pretty fantastic coin hoard, uh, which consists of, I believe it was over 3,000 coins or up to 3,000, primarily silver, but also bronze and gold coins. Uh, coins, um, the dating of which I believe is about 17th century. Uh, I mentioned that there was some excavation here at the hall. Uh, this was not extensive in 2018. In fact, um, the extent of the excavation in the hall was a sondage that took place here in this kind of northeastern corner, um, right around here. Uh, and this actually revealed uh, just above one and a half meters, or excuse me, uh, almost one and a half meters below uh, a series of installations that took almost the form of benches, or maybe they were table supports uh, around this area. Um, another interesting uh, point that I forgot to mention about Frigidarium 1 is that uh, in addition to the coins, uh, we do have an area or some evidence for what appeared to be some clay processing. Now I have 2019 here because uh, the excavation of the hall here was completed in 2019 and you can see that um, this later wall, uh, that is this wall that was installed later, uh, we were able to reveal that this kind of juts out into almost this, this bench here and of course we have this reused uh, column here. Um, perhaps associated with this opening and the hypothesis right now uh, is perhaps this was some kind of press uh, or maybe even wine press and we can talk about this. Uh, Frigidarium 2 uh, we worked on in 2019. Uh, this was similar in terms of uh, kind of what we had to tackle in terms of removing fill and collapsed stone from the bath, um, as well as uh, a blocked entryway. Uh, if you look at the plan here, obviously these were open, but both of these were blocked at a later date by walls uh, that we subsequently removed. Um, uh, before we hit this very nice geometric mosaic, we encountered uh, this, again, another series of installations in these square and rectangular formations um, that look like basins or pools. Uh, in addition to that, we also found some skeletal remains, and I forgot to mention, very importantly, that uh, we also discovered human skeletal remains in the hall here immediately above the mosaic. So that was 2018 and 2019. Obviously, we had a break in work in 2020, um, but we returned in 2021 
uh, with a much smaller team, which meant that uh, we were again pretty focused in where we wanted to work. Um, previous work in 2018 and 2019 uh, focused uh, on the north and on the colder bank of rooms, Frigidarium one and two and the hall here. Uh, so in order to, to again get a, a better picture of the structure of the bath, uh, we decided to, to excavate here in this southeast area um, and excavate a, a hot room. Uh, simultaneously, we also started work to reveal the corridor entrance, uh, which would have been the main entryway into the bath and into the hall. Uh, again, as you can see from this plan, that was later uh, blocked. That entry was uh, blocked at a later date. Um, so our work here, uh, we, we call this area the southeast area. Um, and then here is a view of what that corridor kind of entryway uh, looked like uh, before we began work in 2021. So I'll just take you through a few, uh, take you through a few images um, so that you can see our progress. Uh, and unexpectedly, you know, we kind of measured our work area, our trench according to the size of the rooms uh, immediately to the north, thinking that this would follow a similar uh, kind of structure formats. Um, but we were surprised when this wall popped up here. We have this pier and this wall that kind of uh, popped up interrupting uh, our nice idea of what we thought this room was going to be. Um, and we have more installations here on the western end. So here's our the western end where we have these installations. Here it is uh, up here at the top of the photograph on the bottom right. Um, these installations are pretty similar to those that we saw uh, in the sondage from the hall uh, that were uh, uncovered in 2018. Uh, I'll make a note as well. Um, you can't see it here. I think I have another image. We did find um, some nice uh, pipes, some, some flues it would seem for allowing air to escape from the room. Uh, as well as these openings and a nice uh, intact uh, pipe going through the wall here. Uh, what we didn't find in this room uh, was the suspensura or the, the subfloor um, or, or any kind of uh, basales that would <laughs> testify to a kind of hypocaust system. Um, although you can see remnants of that here if you look closely and in other areas of the room as well. But it seems that all of this was removed again at a later date um, so that the room could be uh, repurposed. Um, and we can see evidence of that in some of these installations as well. As I mentioned, we also began work on the corridor. Uh, our foreman, Rami Tunjer, began work there on his own. Uh, clearing this space entirely to reveal the entryway of the corridor. Uh, I'll just make a note here. We do have the, the south end of the wall of this area we were just looking at, and we can see uh, it collapsing outward. Uh, so here's Rafi working on this area here. Uh, we did get a nice uh, threshold. Um, <laughs> we were surprised, though, that we did not encounter a mosaic, uh, which is what we were expecting in this corridor. Uh, what we did encounter uh, immediately outside of the corridor on the east uh, was this little area right here, uh, which was very suspect. Um, and I'll talk about this again in a second. I'm trying to keep track of time here. Um, so here's another view of the corridor. We can see this entryway right here. Here's that southeast area that we worked on in 2021. Um, we can also see the, the pavement and the series of, of steps going up uh, to, the, to the east and around. Uh, and here just behind is that suspect area that I was just pointing at. Uh, and if you can make note that uh, we do have another later installation bisecting the corridor. And we'll see a better image here in a minute uh, where you can see this in all of its glory, if you will. 
Um, at the end of the season, uh, toward the end of the season in 2021, uh, having uh, you know almost finished work in the southeast area here, uh, we were really working on this up until the last day to find the floor, uh, to find the you know the lowest levels. Uh, we did decide to open up Frigidarium uh, three, and actually let me go back and point that out on the map for you, or the plan, excuse me. So we did decide to open up uh, Frigidarium three here and start some work. So I don't have that many slides here for Frigidarium three. You can see what it looked like initially, um, but uh, what was very surprising, uh, we knew that we were not that far above uh, a mosaic um, and uh, we were only excavating a you know, a week if that's when we came down uh, upon some more human remains right here in the northeast corner. Um, this happened again pretty close to the end of the season. Uh, and so we had to work quickly um, to remove uh, this human skeleton that is not formally buried. Um, and we know this because there's evidence of stones from the, the collapse. Uh, kind of destroying, uh, smashing in the, the skull and other parts of the body. It was also very convenient uh, that our skeletal remains here are in the most dangerous corner of this room because right here I've highlighted uh, <laughs> the wall which is on the verge of collapse. So in addition to just running out of time, um, we also thought it was not very prudent to continue excavating in Frigidarium 3 until we uh, took care of this uh, wall um, and braced it properly. And that's what we would do in 2022. Uh, so 2022, uh, we were extremely ambitious um, in what we hope to accomplish at the bath, uh, I've highlighted all of the areas where we either continued work started in the previous season and uh, maybe started work uh, anew. Uh, in the corridor right here where Rafi Tunjer started in 2021, uh, we wanted to extend that um, as much as we could. Uh, we wanted to explore outside of the corridor, work on this area of the hall uh, immediately south of Frigidarium 2, and we wanted to continue work on Frigidarium 3, and then Frigidarium 4 here. So uh, I'll just go through some of these areas fairly quickly. The corridor here, um, we did, uh, I guess as to be expected at this point, because we found several human remains, as I mentioned in uh, the hall, uh, some bits in Frigidarium 1, and uh, the occasional human bone uh, in the southeast area. So, uh, and Frigidarium 3 here. It's no one's surprise we did find human remains uh, in the corridor. Um, and uh, thankfully this season, uh, Megan was present and so she was able to, to take charge of excavating uh, these um, human uh, non-burials. It does not seem like this is necessarily, a, again, a formal burial, uh, but we can talk about this some more. Uh, we decided to do some test trenches here, some test pits uh, to see if we had additional human remains. And in fact, we did. Um, I believe there were at least a total of two skeletons uh, from the corridor. And so we're expecting to find more um, in subsequent seasons. Uh, so our, our skeletons uh, were here. And uh, Megan, correct me if I'm wrong uh, in the question and answer, but I think it was over here as well. I'm, I'm forgetting at this very moment. Uh, and then various other bits of human bone throughout. But you can see that we don't have a mosaic. Uh, we do have our, our threshold, but our room has been bisected and our corridor has been repurposed. Uh, so as I said, we expect this to continue um, and to find more human remains uh, in subsequent seasons. So we there also, were, uh, just to go back to uh -huh. that slide, 
in the bottom left and in the top right is where the two skeletons were. And there was evidence of a third individual that as we were just getting to the the big uh, mass bulkhead. Yeah, (laughs) okay. So this is something or someone that I suspect we'll we'll uncover um, in the next season or two. Uh, So some more exciting work was on the corridor and the the corridor vault, uh, which you can see we still have a bit of it intact. We have some of the springing intact. Um, at the end of the season, we were able to, to clear, clear it out and really expose our, our vault here. Uh, but also exciting was a series of roof tiles that we found in situ and intact. Um, again, something we can talk about, um, but I'm, I'm trying to keep note of, of time here, so I have to move on. Uh, here's just another view of our, our vault here. Right. And our, our roof tiles here and the the end of the corridor, the, the north end of the corridor is is here uh, and it's it's yet to be determined if we have an entrance uh, on this end or if it's completely closed. So outside uh, of the corridor, this area here, here's that suspicious area we noted in 2021 with this hardened red dirt. We worked here. Um, make note of this feature right here, I'll I'll bring that up again. Uh, Here, maybe one of the more exciting finds from the season aside from our intact roof tiles is uh, an intact kiln. Um, I know that uh, Asena was especially excited about this this discovery here, um, which uh, does have uh, some ceramics uh, still in place. Um, And we did find quite a bit of ceramics over here uh, that seem to be in association with the kiln. Uh, here's the exterior view, uh, trying to find the entrance um, of the kiln, uh, which Asena maybe will want to talk about um, in her presentation or in the question and answer here as she took over in that last week. Now, uh, I'll quickly say that that feature that I, I pointed out right here does appear to be a window and perhaps changes uh, our initial plan and Hoover's plan of the small bath because we suspect that this may be uh, an apse that extends from the corridor to the east here. Okay, so we also worked in the hall um, where no surprise at this point uh, we found numerous later installations uh, breaking up the hall into various uh, rectangular or square spaces. Uh, And this space over here uh, seemed to be a kind of workspace. Um, There are lots of bones and uh, evidence of of burning uh, charcoal and things of that sort in this space. Um, We also found this nice column base uh, not that far uh, underneath. So here, uh, let me go back if I can. We have this wall here, this later wall, uh, which we did decide to uh, remove um, in order to to get to the floor, knowing that we had mosaic here already. Uh, And to our surprise, we found a very large press stone. seems to be an olive uh, press stone. Uh, extremely heavy. Uh, we wanted to get to the mosaic and so uh, luckily we had a great crew who were able to slide this stone into Frigidarium too uh, until we can kind of move it out, uh, hopefully at a later date. Uh, and as I mentioned, we uh, revealed uh, lots of nice geometric mosaics uh, in the hall, but unfortunately they're, they're quite uh, in, a, in a poor state because of these later installations. Okay, so I'll, I'll go quickly through uh, Frigidaria 3 and 4. Remember we started uh, Frigidarium 3 in 2021. Um, when we discovered our human skeletal remains here, and I mentioned the very dangerous uh, wall on uh, 
you know, the verge of collapse. So we had our demiurgy come in and embrace the wall so that we can work safely in the room. And no surprise, <laughs> um, have not come down on any mosaics, but did in fact find uh, more human remains uh, and a really spectacular uh, installation upon which is yet another later installation here. Uh, you can see some of our, our basins here. Uh, this is perhaps a drain. I'll go back. Uh, that's connecting perhaps to Frigidarium too. Uh, and you can see that this was filled in uh, to uh, make way for building these later basins right here. Um, and then there's Frigidarium 4, uh, which I will just say is a, a never ending uh, project. Um, we can see that we have a nice doorway here that connects to the hall. Uh, we began work uh, very ambitiously on room four. Um, we suspected that it might be a latrine. Uh, we're not entirely sure of its function because this is the only entryway into the bath is this connection right here, this doorway into the hall. It does not appear that there's a way to enter here from the, the west. Uh, we decided to, to bisect it uh, and only work on the, the southern half of it because of the numerous finds um, that are coming out of this room uh, that, as I said, is just never ending. So we did discover a, a wall here on the, the west end. Um, and we also use this app as an opportunity to dig a foundation trench to help with the dating of uh, the bath, um, which is like most baths in this area, probably to the around the second, third centuries. Um, but this is to, to be continued. And uh, for the moment, I'll just give you a, a nice uh, sampling of some of the really cool finds that we've uh, discovered from Frigidarium 4. Uh, where we'll continue work in the next season and maybe find the floor, but I, I don't know. I don't know how optimistic I am about that. Uh, here, I'll leave you with uh, some nice views of uh, the bath and the work that we've done to, to date. Uh, thanks to Brian Cannon for uh, completing these, doing these for us. Um, here's the kiln over here uh our corridor one two three four and our hall over here uh, so i'll end there because i'm i'm over time uh here's a reminder uh, again of the the space and the mosaics we've uncovered so far in these later installations uh and i'll i'll end and say uh thank you to to all the folks who've worked on uh the small bath and and made all of this possible it's been quite a feat Yes, thank you so much, Leticia. Uh, yes, the small bath offers us interesting finds and it's very uh, exciting, actually. And uh, your presentation titles is perfect match, actually, uh, with the small bath, because really, uh, I'm exciting about the kiln, about the findings, and uh, we will see also this year and we will continue. Thank you for your presentation and also uh, thank you for your work. Thank you. Yes, now uh, the professor Arkoan uh, will speak and also I will give to some information about her. Uh, professor Arkoan is graduated in architecture in Eskisehir Osman Gazi University. She has master degree in archaeology department at Atatürk University and PhD in Akdeniz University. She had postdoctoral research in Middle East Technical University. Among her research interests and publications are history of domestic architectural and day life, archaeological restoration and rural architecture. She has worked and responsible architect several excavation projects. She is also vice director uh, of the Antioch at Kragum and a research member at Talmasso survey project. Since 2017, she teaches at Alanya Keikubat University and the leading a group in second and third years architectural design studio, architectural history and conservation project. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm sharing. Uh, is it visible? Yes, yes, everything's okay. Thank you. Uh, today, I will give a presentation on the architectural documentation of the ancient city of Antioquia at Kragun and architectural protection proposals for some buildings. The Antioquia at Kragum excavation, of which I have been a member since 2019, has been a school for architecture students, and uh, students have also been able to complete their compulsory internships as excavation members. As a school, there is an education system that students experience by practicing on one on uh, in the field. In the field, students take digital and traditional measurements, land elevation measurements, photographs, sketches, draft drawings, sketch drawings, and uh, also uh, office work. They combine these works with various uh, programs and convert them digitally. Approximately 20 architecture students participate every year. Students have uh, the chance to apply some of the theoretical stud studies uh, they have seen theoretically during the course here by doing survey studies of architectural remains together, sorting and uh, documentation in the field. All documentation, uh, three-dimensional restoration and conservation work are carried out together with the architecture student team. Architectural documentation at Antioquia at Kragum is carried out in three different ways. Which methods will be used in the buildings depends on the size and preservation status of buildings. The first method is scanning the structures with a three-dimensional laser scanner and documenting the data obtained. It is generally preferred to large-scale structures. During the excavation season of 2022, Measurements were taken for the latrine and vegetarian uh, structure in this way. In this method, the point cloud data obtained with the laser scanner were digitally converted into plans, sections, and facade views of the building, and these were converted into two-dimensional drawings in scale. The images show the point cloud images obtained for the latrine. The building is documented as a whole. For this reason, two-dimensional ready-to-draw orthophotos of plans, sections, and views can be produced as desired. Here you can see the plan and section drawings drawn in scale over the plan and section orthophotos produced for latrine. Here we see the point cloud data obtained as a result of the three-dimensional laser scanning we had done for the vegetarian structure in the season of 2022. Here, orthophotos of plant sections and elevation can be taken and drawings can be made as desired. Plan and section drawings made on the point clouds obtained for the vegetarian structure are shown. The other method is to document the structure of finds through orthophotos obtained by photogrammetry. Digital documentation studies are carried out using terrestrial photogrammetry techniques to create three-dimensional models of the structures. Ages of MetaShape professional program is used for this. Two-dimensional photographs of the buildings are taken and uh, three-dimensional models are obtained by processing them in the edges of MetaShape professional program. Two-dimensional photographs obtained with a simple camera and unmanned aerial vehicle are used in two-dimensional photography. In this method, photographs of buildings or objects are taken horizontally or vertically in a certain sequence and order, processed in program, and orthophotos are obtained. 50 photographs were taken and processed to produce this orthophoto. In this study, 416 photographs are processed with the program and converted into the orthophotos. 
In this study, 844 photographs were taken and processed in the program and this orthophoto image was obtained. Another method is the documentation studies carried out in the field with traditional methods. In this method, plans and sectional sketches of the buildings are made with traditional surveying techniques and measurement studies are carried out. In addition, the accuracy of the data obtained by the other two methods is also checked by this method. In fact, all methods complement each other's deficiencies. In some documentation studies, it can be seen all three methods are used together. Here again, the survey and sketch studies carried out in the field can be seen. With the data obtained as a result of these studies, restitution studies of the buildings can be carried out. The picture shows the reconstruction proposal of the phantom structure in the center according to the finds recovered. In addition to the architectural documentation of existing structure, the conservation of the finds uncovered during the excavation season is also being carried out. Currently, a project is underway to conserve and display the floor mosaic of the palestra and latrine structures in front of the great bed. The rectangular area to the east of the great bed is the palestra of the bed with a pool in the center. The pool is surrounded by geometrically decorated mosaics. The exhibition of mosaics in this area, approximately 700 square meters, is important for the promotion of the city. For this reason, a protective roof and a sightseeing route where the mosaics can be exhibited and protected are proposed. The proposed work for the palestra mosaics is shown in the picture. When the works are completed, the projects will be submitted to the Cultural Heritage Conservation Board. Here is proposal for the protection and display of the mosaics of the Great Bed Palestra. Latrine, which is the one of the special structures of the city, belongs to the L-type latrine group and it's important as it's the second known example of this type in Anatolia. It's also important for the city as it is the first mosaic with figured panels to be unearthed. For these reasons, the clean mosaic is planned to be opened and exhibited. Uh, the picture shows the protection roof and the display format designed for the display of the latrine mosaic. Here are views of the protection roof from different angles. In addition, the roof tiles found in this building are planned to be reproduced within the scope of the experimental archaeology and used as a roof coverings. Interior views are also seen here. During the excavations carried out on the colonnaded street in the years 2021 and 2022, a large number of nearly complete roof tiles were recovered. All of these roof tiles, which were close to complete or could give measurements, were documented and average measurements were taken from them. Some examples of these roof tiles can be seen. After the documentation of the recovered roof tiles is completed, an experimental archaeology study for the production of roof tiles is planned for this excavation season. Afterwards, they will be proposed to be used for the roofing and protection roofs. The colonnaded street, one of the most important focal points of the city, is the part that visitors pass through the most. For this reason, the works here are important. In the excavation season of 2014, column bases were made and two columns were raised and put in place. When the excavation of all the shops on the street is completed, it's planned to replace the columns on the style of it 
and as a continuation of the previous work. Thank you for listening. And also, I would like to thank my students who participate in excavation and took part in the uh, architectural drawing and models. Thank you so much, Professor Erkolan. It's uh, also it's very important responsibility to record and protect the structures and after the excavations and also because of this also we are so lucky because of uh, you and because you work it's not only for the like a vice director also like archaeologist and like the architecture and uh, also the thank you for your presentation thank you and now and uh, uh, professor murphy will start but also i will give uh, i want to give some information about uh, him Professor Murphy is a longtime member of the American Institute of Archaeology and an avid avocational archaeologist. He is focused on the study of ancient water system in southern Turkey and has presented the results of his work at American Institute of Archaeology annual meetings and international conferences. He holds a liberal art degree from the University of Calif and is an active member of the Front Union Society and German Water History Society throughout which he published the results of his studies. He has been working with the University of Nebraska to study the water management system in Antioquia at Kragum since 2015. When not researching ancient water system, he is an ad hoc material engineering consistent of the NASA Artemis Orion Mars exploration programs. Okay, here you go. Thank you, Misa. Thank you. I mean, uh, Sina, um, <clears throat> for that warm welcome. Let me see if I can share here. <clears throat> I want to thank uh, the organizers, and particularly Michael, of course, and uh, Sina and Nisa, and for all of their support since so much of what we've done in the last few years have been off site and whatever. Today we'll talk about the water management system, focusing initially on the water supply, the spring, reservoir, channels, and aqueduct, and then later on progressing to the urban water supply, pipes, and cisterns, where for the most part our my colleagues and that are covering that as well. So we sh should get covered there. The aqueduct itself that supplied the city and the bathhouse is 3.2 kilometers along. It's spring fed. Uh, today, the spring actually still has a little trickle of water that's used by the local residents uh, in that area. Just to highlight a couple of the areas, we spent uh, the first several years, to 2015 through 18, just doing a surface survey manually since we didn't have LIDAR and all the sophisticated instruments we do today, uh, trying to find remnants of the aqueduct as it came from the end of the spring. And it was through the help of Rami Bay who uh, located uh, the spring and the reservoir. So I'm indebted to them. The water supply going from, just to highlight section by section, we went from the spring to this reservoir and then again along a water channel and some foundation walls across to where a bridge crossed where the modern highway has completely destroyed the bridge. And uh, <clears throat> so here's a rendition which I have thanks to Brian Cannon who has been instrumental in all of this process throughout the years. Um, Looking at the reservoir in 2018, if you see the uh, top photo, it was heavily covered with uh, brush and it took a great deal of clearing. And after two years in 2019 and 21, uh, we were able to clear the reservoir so that we could get a better view. Uh, again, measuring roughly, uh, you know, 21 and a half by almost 20 by five meters deep. And uh, again, on the Northwest corner, we have not, we've not been able to find any pieces of the channel from the spring to the reservoir uh, because it's heavily uh, 
uh, you know, done with agriculture. There's a uh, Jami, a mosque on site. So we probably never will. But I think we might have located uh, on the northwest corner where it had come in, but we'll need someday to excavate there to, for sure. Uh, again, major survey points along the wall, reservoir. We um, found some substructure walls along here, a section of water channel that's very interesting. We'll talk about aqueduct substructure and then the piers. Um, the gully wall that I just pointed out going from the reservoir down is about a meter and a half wide. <clears throat> we were able to clear a lot of brush off that and be able to survey that. Uh, possible orientation of the wall to the reservoir. Uh, it looks like that again, but we need excavation. Um, now we get into the, some of the fun parts, the, the water channel. Not a great deal is left of the water channel. Uh, you see the original uh, stone blocks for the original channel, and then looking up the ridge, you still have in place the hydraulic plaster of the base and uh, opus ignitum. What's interesting about the channel is that section there, um, here you have the original outline of the channel, and you have the original opus signetum hydraulic plaster. And then in a later phase, uh, whether it was due to problems with the design uh, of the flow or, or whatever, we've not been able to tell, a uh, terracotta U-channel was installed along the length of it in a heavy base of uh, hydraulic uh, white mortar. And here you have an interesting uh, section with built up mineral incrustation called center within the U channel itself. So uh, again, the aqueduct uh, followed a substructure wall <clears throat> and to the point to where it crossed where the modern highway is across a section of piers. This remaining pier is the tallest at five meters. And there is one little piece of, uh, uh, of the spectus of the original channel up here. Again, another survey point showing the, the reservoir, the, the water channel section along the wall, uh, ridge line with the wall, the, the piers across the highway and the elevations. And then, we did follow um, the, we found three pieces of the channel across the hillside where the aqueduct followed the contour lines down into this point here, which is the last section of the uh, ch water channel as it entered the city. No other pieces have been found due to the heavy tilling and plowing of the uh, agriculture and the covering up and terracing. Uh, but based on the different pieces, we've been able to confirm that the, the water, the original water channel was 30, averaged 35 centimeters wide, 40 centimeters high, with a wall thickness of uh, 30 to 33 centimeters thick on the walls. Other sections showed it, the opus ignitum going up on the hillside sections up to 37 to 40 centimeters high. Again, just a quick slope. Here's a, where we've been able to, following the contour lines, show where the aqueduct went along the hillsides. Uh, we have a dramatic slope from the cistern, uh, the reservoir down along to the aqueduct bridge of 6%, very unusual. That's also could be why they had trouble with the channel sections where I showed you the U section channel being installed, et cetera. Then briefly talking about the urban water supply, <clears throat> I'll touch on just a little bit showing some pictures of the pipes because the, the other excavators include those into their presentations. Um, and we've done uh, 
uh, ourselves. We've concentrated now in the 21-22 seasons, actually 28, where we've concentrated on two of the cisterns. Uh, and here in this site plan, we show where there's the last section of the water channel that entered the city here. There's a cistern here and the aqueduct, we've not found any pieces of it. Uh, however, it had to follow the contour lines to in, be able to service the, uh, uh, the bath and the fountain. Here we have uh, the aerial view of the bath, the palestra, the later th third century, and the fountain down here. The, there was a lead pipe located here that we assume was the water inlet for the palestra, and there's a lead pipe here that serviced the fountain. Uh, in a later picture, there's a large excavation that they've done uncovering uh, a uh, earlier phase water pipes down in here. There we go. Um, so here you have some, which the, the larger pipes are typically from the earlier phase. When they installed the palestra, it was uh, cut off. These were cut off. So uh, we're not exactly sure what happened to the water supply after that. Uh, and later on in 2022, just to see this past season, uh, excavators opened up by the shop one, uh, another section of later phase uh, water pipe towards the, the bath area um, with another pipe coming down that intersected here of rib pipes. And it's interesting because you have an 18 centimeter diameter uh, rib pipe then joining up with a 23 centimeter pipe here that led up along here and up along the shop, the shops up again towards the bath, but no real you know, information on exactly where and whatever. Hopefully more excavating will be done and we'll be able to follow the pipes. Again, you've already seen a, an aerial view of the colonnaded street in that. Um, just wanted to point out there's a We'll go back to that. And just this last season, we excavated parts of a cistern, the East City Gate cistern here, and then along up along over here, um, the West Slope cistern that we'll talk about. There's the uh, 2022 area. And what was important, and we'll go back to this again, this cistern here, you could hardly see it, but once it was uh, cleaned and that it was shown to where it was actually built into the same time that the defensive wall was set up in what we think the fourth century. So this cistern here, we dated to a later uh, phase. Again, back to the cisterns, we'll talk about the West Slope and then the East City Gate. Again, the West Slope cistern is located here and you have the trail and the, the, the street that went up to the Acropolis. So this is down on the hillside here on the Western side of the city. On this diagram, anything marked with a little tiny blue spot means that it's been a water feature. There was actually a water channel along here um, and that there is one shop that I don't, didn't include because again, I think maybe our colleagues covered it where there's a water pipe coming into the shop here as well. The, the West Slope Cistern we did in 2018. My colleague, Norm, uh, nor Hymans was not able to attend today, uh, but uh, she is a professor, was retired now, a professor at Maastricht University and then in the US at Hunter College uh, for many years. 
and uh, she holds doctorates in uh, uh, art history and archaeology. So I'm grateful for her help and contribution. We work together. Uh, in 2018, again, the excavation, uh, we, we did a large uh, two by two, actually expanded even more uh, meter square to get down to the base of this cistern. It was quite deep, four meters deep and four meters from the ridge line here where the extratos started. And so that's four meters down there. Uh, up here in the rooftop, there was a central opening there for water offtake. You can see where the, the uh, barrel vaulted ceiling was built using a plank structure. You can see the indentation of the planks still there. Some of the finds from this cistern, you know, we're, we're grateful uh, to Michael Hoff and that, that we're able to do the, uh, some of the infrastructure of the city. Not many excavations uh, have time, money, or uh, the wherewithal to, to look at the infrastructure, but it's important because every city needed water. And uh, in, within this excavation, we found, you know, pieces of some lamps, some pottery, and uh, we don't get the exciting things. We don't get typically dead bodies or coin hoards or whatever. But again, we get excited over holes in the ground, drains, sewers. So that for us is, is our treat. Um, again, we had to use the ladder and up, up and down with the kufas to get the dirt out, finally reaching the floor covered with hydraulic plaster, lipping up over the walls. Uh, and again, the walls of the cistern are covered with opus ignitum hydraulic plaster up to four, four meters. Moving on to the uh, East City Gate, we excavated this past season. Um, well, again, parts of it. There it is again on the diagram right there. And again, clearing the brush, from from there, it's a double barrel vaulted cistern, meaning two chambers, A and B. The second chamber, B, was again built integrally into the structure of the defensive wall. Later on in clearing it, they, we found a great deal of debris all down here that covered it. And at the top there, they're clearing up here uh, for a platform. And here you see on top of the, here's the opening to the cistern down below. And this platform here uh, was excavated. And what was interesting, we found a threshold to a doorway and broken here, would have extended over to here. Uh, and in this point right here, was a, uh, uh, a small pottery cup. And then adjacent to that was a coin of Constantine the first dated to 350 to 355 in this area here. We also found a lot of uh, roof tiles. Um, and what's interesting in the debris fall onto the platform, uh, we think there was another area up above, uh, another platform, and we found in the debris painted a uh, wall plaster. Uh, so that was intriguing. Some uh, recycled or repurposed possibly uh, capital piece. We're not sure how it was used. And again, more painted and a little piece of mosa white mosaic, lots of uh, nails. And again, like I said, roof tiles. Inside, um, as we open the square, we have a pass-through somewhat destroyed here that would have allowed water to pass through from between chambers A and B. That's not terribly uncommon when you have a double bar barrel vaulted uh, um, um, structure. And again, what's interesting, this was not a real deep 
system. Um, you have 4.2 long depth by uh, three meters. That's actually three meters, not a 0.3 wide and only two meters deep. This chamber B, we've not cleaned very well or excavated at all. It's uh, the same length or depth, but it's wider than uh, the other one, 3.8. What was interesting here, we, we found the bottom of the floor and it was uh, field stones set in lime mortar and then covered with hydraulic plaster. And you have uh, the same technique of the hydraulic plaster is in really bad shape, but you had the same technique with the hydraulic plaster lipped up inside. In the last two days, typically, like any good excavation, was for us the exciting part, because this is showing the outside of the front of chamber A uh, of the cistern. And looking down, we came down to where there's hydraulic plaster, opus signetum, and it's lipped up along the side of the wall of the front outside of the cistern. You have to use your imagination here. And we only had time to excavate 60 centimeters here, but we did a little extra over here to extend it. So we find that it was 70 centimeters wide. Next year, we hope to remove this bulk here because the last 10 centimeters will hopefully expose the wall, which we think was forming a water tank on the outside of the cistern. Uh, we're not sure how it operated over here on, the, on chamber B. Uh, so that needs to be removed and then we'll, we'll be able to answer that question. And here we have chamber B with my colleague coming out there. And as any good thing, everybody's uh, uh, ended with their teammates. We had many thanks to the, our small teams. Normally we operated with only three or four uh, students and a laborer or whatever. So my thanks to them and again to the colleagues who uh, supplied us that and the help. And uh, with that, I'm probably done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Murphy. And uh, yes, uh, water systems are important also for understanding many activities of the ancient cities. And therefore, uh, your studies provide very important data for also our research. And uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, Elsa. And uh, now we can start the discussion part. Uh, the audience can write their question in the chat section. And then after we will give the uh, little break for the second part of the program. And uh, now uh, we will wait to question actually. Can I, Can I ask, a, ask a question of Leticia? <laughs> oh, yeah, me sure. <laughs> yes. um, you, you, you said in the course of your uh, talk, which is very fascinating, by the way, I, I do not know how you keep all of that together. Um, <laughs> the question on everybody's mind, or at least mine, is what's going on with all those bodies? That <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, Megan and Emily are going to help me out with that one. Um, I uh, the the one in Trigadarium one, if I remember correctly, that one appears to have been thrown in there or just kind of uh, disposed of. In, I'm sorry, in in the hall and uh, just south of Trigadarium one. 
Uh, the other ones, it's unclear in Frigidarium 3. Um, it, we thought, okay, this, this doesn't look like a formal burial because there, there's no, like, there's nothing protecting the body. It was just kind of smashed in. The ones in the corridor, maybe these are a, a bit more kind of planned out uh, because of their, their spacing and their orientation. And as, I, I think if, especially if we see or find uh, more as we go into the corridor, um, so it seems like the bath is maybe uh, in some, for, for some, like a convenient dumping ground <laughs> for, for bodies, uh, for some unfortunate victims, and for others, maybe a, a nice, uh, I don't know, with the case of the corridor, at least, uh, uh, another convenient spot, but maybe they're not necessarily being disposed of. Um, perhaps these are proper interments. Um, but this is not the usual kind of burial context that, that mm -hmm. we're used to. Um, and I believe, uh, Megan, I, the, you and Emily can help me with this. I think the one in the hall in, in uh, South of Frigidarium 1, this one showed evidence of trauma, I believe, this, uh, this male. Um, and yeah. all of them have been males so far. Yeah, over in this area, they've all been male. And um, I'm just going to, you know, leave the uh, suspense for our talk about. Okay, Megan, I, I should have, I should have um, <laughs> held my tongue, I guess. But I, I'm dying to know. <laughs> it, it's very interesting because in that corridor, um, they do seem to be burials within sort of this tertiary context, but they are disturbed. Um, the lower limbs were removed and that was done after burial. Uh, so very interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, and thanks. I'll say as well to help answer the question uh, that we actually have um carbon dating coming out because I think that there's a real interesting story that, uh, well, they're working on it now, but there's a very interesting story to look at the use of the space over time uh, because as Leticia and uh, also Megan said, you know, this is obviously some are in very different contexts than the others. Some are obviously more recent um, as opposed to others. So it'll be nice to have the carbon dating to kind of suss those things out. Great. Thank you. Hi, Emily, by the way. <laughs> hi, Sarah. <laughs> Don't say <it> hi. <laughs> Very nice to see you. <laughs> yes. And uh, now I can uh, check the chat parts. And uh, Leticia, you have another question. Uh, I will read uh, directly to you. And maybe you can see also the question in the chat part. Can you see it? Uh, yes, I see. So the question is the large, large meal type stones. Okay. Um, the question was these, these stones that were found uh, in the hall south of Frigidarium 1, if these were related to wine production, uh, and would that have associated with the large stone tool found outside of Frigidarium 2? So it seems it's not clear if uh, the the stones um, and these uh, you know the, the the column from the hall south of Frigidarium one and then the other stone uh, also from the hall outside of Frigidarium two. If these things are related, there definitely is some kind of industry happening here. But the question is what, um, and if it's all happening at the same time. So in uh, the hall outside of Frigidarium one, uh, the hypothesis is that perhaps there is some kind of wine production happening uh, here. Um, whether or not that's related to what's going on uh, just west of, uh, just, just on the west, on the other side of this later wall uh it's it's unsure but that stone uh which is a reused architectural fragment um that looked like it was more associated with uh, like an olive press um or some some kind of oil uh oil press um so maybe wine oil maybe as i said in frigidarium one it looked like there was some kind of clay processing going on I neglected to mention that in Frigidarium two, all of these basins, uh, these square and rectangular stone basins, um, 
you know, it's been suggested that perhaps this is some kind of, this has to do with tanning perhaps because there's water involved. Um, I would hope that tanning is not happening at the same time as any kind of oil <laughs> production or wine production. Um, but uh, again, it doesn't, it, these are not all necessarily happening simultaneously uh, because as we saw with Frigidarium 3, we have several, uh, we have several layers there, right? We have several phases where the mosaic was, was taken out and there's uh, one installation with these large basins, but then these were filled in. And then we have more of these kind of stone basins that look more like what we saw in Frigidarium 2. Um, so it's, it's all very confusing <laughs> right now. And again, this is what I was referring to uh, in my initial talk title. Uh, and when I said that uh, each season uh, poses a new series of, of questions for us um, that we we need to answer. But yeah, definitely industry happening. And that's not even taking into account the the kiln <laughs> that's, that's going on. It's, it's on the, the east outside of the corridor. Yes, actually, actually the Silesia region produced the, both uh, the olive oil and also the wine. And they're a little bit similar to the reconstruction. And then the, we uh, need to little more uh, the proof actually uh, for this, but there could be wine, uh, could be olive oil, of course, because also this is the typical product uh, for the Silesia region. Yes, thank you so much. And we have two more questions. Uh, if there is time, uh, yes, we have time. It's not so much, but we have time. What's the estimated time period that the kiln might have been in use? And was the hallway also decoratively mosaic? It looked like in on the floor map, though, I don't real it having a pattern during excavation in uh, 2018, exciting if so. So the, 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 the time for the kiln, um, Asena, you will be able to answer this. <laughs> yes, yes, actually I will, I will say something, some hypothesis uh, about the kiln in my presentation, yes, but it looks like the Roman and uh, it looks like to fourth century AD, but yeah, I, will I was, I was going to again. say, you know, just post, post third century and at some point yeah. after the yeah. bath, Going out of use, presumably. Um, and the hall does have, uh, if, if you're, if I mean the, the central hall, uh, uh, it does have a mosaic floor um, outside of Frigidarium 1 and Frigidarium 2. It was this very nice geometric mosaic um, just south of Frigidarium 1. Uh, it's better preserved. Uh, outside of Frigidarium II, there was more disruption in terms of these later installations. If you remember, there were several walls uh, and also this uh, kind of circular series of, of stones uh, on the, the southwest uh, corner of uh, this area of the hall. But we also have a more geometric mosaic, um, although it's not following the same pattern as in the the, the eastern part of the hall that that is the area of the hall just east of, of this area um, but but it does have mosaic yes thank you uh, also the audience to say thank you uh, okay is there any question also between us <laughs> this is a good chance also for you to speak about <laughs> Kragman findings and uh, I, I actually had a, a question for Nisa. I don't think I heard it. Um, Nisa, what was the, on your, your proposals for the protective coverings uh, for, and, and kind of the viewing areas for the mosaics? What was the, were these like metal bars? I couldn't tell in the, in the image. There's there's a roof and then there were there were bars. I was just curious about materials and what was going on there. It's wood. It will be wood. Okay. okay. Yeah, the plans look really fantastic. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. And it's it's great to to see the 
overview of everything as it's coming together, Leticia, because I, you know, seeing big picture stuff, this is a really nice thing. I was saying to Michael that we should do this every year (laughs) just to kind of, you know, get the big picture. Thanks. Okay, I think uh, we have no more question. And also uh, we will make the, another second discussion uh, parts and the end of the second parts. And now we can give the little break. And then after we will start the second parts. And uh, okay, we have 10 minutes. <laughs> See you in the 10 minutes. Okay, okay. We can start to second parts and then we will continue with Professor Moore and uh, I will give some information also for her. Professor Moore is the Associated Dean of the Honors College at Eastern Michigan University this last year and Professor in Anthropology at Eastern Michigan University for the last 10 years. Professor Moore's research in human skeletal biology runs ranges from forensic anthropology and biomedical anthropology of modern Americans to the archaeology of ancient populations in France and Turkey. Additionally, she has served as a forensic anthropology consistent for the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office in Detroit, Michigan. Okay, Professor Moore, you can start. Thank you so much. And now we can see your screen. Yes, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So today, this is going to be some of our new uh, exciting results for for dietary reconstruction from stable isotopes at Antiochia at Craigham. The goal of this project is to compare stable isotopes of bone samples from human and non-human remains from the archaeological site of Antiochia at Craigham. Stable isotope analysis provides information relating to diet and residential mobility of individuals. This presentation begins with a brief discussion of bioarchaeology, what this discipline can offer, and what are some areas of inquiry. We'll proceed to a description of the archeological context of Antiochia Kragum from which the remains were recovered. Our research is based on a strong precedent that establishes the use of stable isotope analysis for dietary reconstruction and residential mobility. We'll explain our methods and analysis and then discuss the results that we have obtained by a stable isotope um, uh, for both the human and non-human remains. And finally, our conclusion and our future research goals will be discussed. Bioarchaeology is a merging of methods in biological anthropology and archaeology. Bioarchaeology contextualizes past populations and their individuals by answering questions about behavior, quality of life, lifestyle, gender, and politics. Bioarchaeology is founded on interdisciplinary collaborations within archaeology, biological anthropology, geology, botany, chemistry, history, etc., with the goal of examining the interrelationships between culture, the environment, and human biology in the past. In 2013, at the Midwest Bioarchaeology and Forensic Anthropology Association 20th Annual Meeting in Columbus, Ohio, Clark Larson gave a profound quote about the importance of bioarchaeology due to its remarkable temporal and global perspective on the human condition not shared by any other human biological sciences. So human remains have been found in three major contexts at the site, at the necropolis, the small bath, and at the acropolis. The site includes this remarkable uh, necropolis consisting of a series of seven tombs that have been heavily looted. Excavation at the tombs during 2018, 2019, and 2022 seasons resulted in the collection and curation of more than 200 kilograms of human cremains or cremated remains. These cremated remains are found at the necropolis within and also outside the tombs as a result of the looting. The image on the right shows the steep cliff face along the Mediterranean reached by hiking through a banana tree forest 
to reach the necrop necropolis, which is shown on the left. A second context of human remains has been discovered at the Small Bath. The so Small Bath is located in the northeast of the larger complex. During the 2018 season, a team excavated the frig frigidarium in the small bath and several days into the excavation found those thousands of coins that are shown here in the image on the left. A few days later, human remains were revealed near the tile floor. And Leticia had talked about that, how it was kind of uh, not quite a burial and partially decomposed. Um, they were determined to be those of a young man who had been deposited there following the disuse of the bath. So not directly on the floor, but very close to the floor. The position of the skeletal articulation indicates that the individual was partially decomposed before the bur before burial underneath the, the soil. Several more individuals have been found in these tertiary use contexts of the small bath along that corridor. And some may be contemporaneous even with the, the coin cache which as was mentioned, dates to the 17th century. To understand the timeline better, we are currently submitting uh, samples for carbon dating. So hopefully this summer we'll have the results from that. So the remains documented here were recovered from a fifth century church located at the Acropolis. And this was before our time. So Tim Howe's team did the work here. The excavation of the remains took place over three field seasons and all the remains were found at different elevations within a 1.5 meter deep deposit of very loose soil scattered with about the apse of the church. The remains were about two meters above the burned beams from the upper floor of the church, which sealed the cache of lamps, glass, bronze, marble, and fine pottery that were later discovered. So this led Tim Howe's team to, who excavated these burials to believe that the remains have no connection with the life and use of the building, but rather date to its afterlife and are likely a heritage burial within the ruins. A mandible was uncovered on the last day of excavation in 2015 with some of the phalanges, ribs and one radius, clavicle and cervical vertebra uh, were uncovered in 2017. And the locations of the bones are marked in the image on the right. So typically our biological or bioarchaeological goal is the estimation of the biological profile, which includes age, sex, and stature estimation, and sometimes ancestry. Additionally, we take note of healed trauma and pathology. We report on any unhealed trauma as well as post-mortem damage. The skeletal remains here are those of an adult individual all of the epiphyses or the growth plates are fused. And based on the auricular surface of the pelvis, the age is estimated to be late 40s or 50s. The biological sex is estimated um, using the pelvis and is indicative of male. And the stature was estimated to be 167 to 175, give or take, uh, centimeters. The heritage burial recovered from the Acropolis shown here, also exhibits lesions that are consistent with metastatic carcinoma. And we had, Emily and I had presented on this uh, a few years ago, uh, using the photo photogrammetry to kind of document and, and actually kind of look into some of those lesions. So also at the Acropolis, there is an adult female burial and an infant skeleton that, were found, that was found inside of an osteotheke jar. At the small bath, there are three clandestine burials from a later time period and three additional burials um, from the hallway that date to a later time. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we excavated two of those, but we are at the beginning of another one. So these all represent a tertiary use of the passageway and the small bath. At the necropolis, there are seven tombs and we've only been able to investigate tomb number two, which includes mostly cremated remains. Over 200 kilograms of material from the looted backfill piles outside the tombs were recovered. And there are remnants of intact burials in the floor of the tomb, 
um, that are not cremated and they are left in situ. And it's just the lower limbs of a, a couple individuals, but the foot of, of one individual and the lower limbs of, of another two individuals. And these excavations will take place in future field seasons. So to understand what isotopes are, we have to review the anatomy of an atom. Atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons and neutrons compose the nucleus of the atom. Isotopes of atoms of the same element, but they have a different number of neutrons, so it alters the atomic mass. And stable isotopes are, are, are thus because they are not emitting radiation and are present in relative abundance in nature. Stable isotope analyses are well established in the scientific literature. And here is just a sampling of some of those research highlights. Vogel and colleague conducted seminal work on maize agriculture in the Americas and were the first to recognize the carbon 13, carbon 12 ratios. This work was validated uh, and added for diet, uh, or adding the nitrogen, sorry. And that was by De Niro and Epstein in 1978 and 1981. Quality control increased the confidence of these methods through studies by Ambrose in 1990 and Van Klinken in 1999. Ehlerringer and colleagues presented the forensic applications of stable isotopes in 2008. Knudsen and Price in 2007 looked at how isotopes can be used for residential mobility, and they can corroborate uh, some of the strontium analyses. And Steckel and, and colleagues in 2002 did a large-scale comparison of human health and diet, uh, tying all of these research lines together. So you are what you eat. When we think about the things we eat, these uh, molecules, these macronutrients are incorporated into our bodies, bones, and our teeth. Macronutrients include carbohydrates, protein, and lipids. And carbohydrates are composed of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, as are lipids, but protein is carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. We can gain good data on isotopes from different tissues in the body. For example, the bone collagen, we can recover information about the carbon and nitrogen. And with bone and tooth appetite, we can recover information on carbon, oxygen, and strontium. So it's important to note that bone is continuously being remodeled throughout our lives and incorporating the isotopes ingested during life. However, teeth only record the isotope exposure while they are de developing. So when the tooth crown forms, um, the the remodeling of the tooth crown stops, but the bones can continue remodeling. So looking at the ratios in the dentition versus in the bones can give an idea of whether the person um, stayed in the same area where they were born. Stable isotopes are of interest to skeletal biologists, and this table represents their abundances in nature. And this was adapted from Katzenberg in 2008. So bone has more uh, carbon-13 because the carbon-12 is secreted more readily. So there's a positive correlation of the delta carbon-13 with animals by diet. For nitrogen, bone collagen is mostly from diet. Marine is more positive than terrestrial because there is a greater length of the trophic chain in the ocean than on land. Thinking of fish eating, you know, little fish, being eaten by bigger fish, by bigger fish, by bigger fish, by bigger fish, if that makes sense. Okay, for collagen synthesis, when bones are being formed, fractionation magnitude is done by enzymatic control within our bodies. So for bone mineral synthesis, environmental temperature determines the magnitude in terms of oxygen isotopes. So whether uh, some of the heavier elements um, are locked up with the lighter elements of oxygen in the ice cores, for example. So for oxygen 18 and oxygen 16 in bone as the product, it differs from the ratio in the substrate, which is in the ocean. But for strontium, the ratio of the product is gonna be the same as the ratio that's in the drinking water with older rocks having more strontium. So it kind of, you can do um, isoscapes and see the different regions um, 
having slightly different patterns based on the bedrock where the, the water is being found. So this kind of ties into the work that Dennis was talking about. So a mass spectrometer is used to do these analyses, um, measuring the mass of each molecule. So it combusts the, the samples into gas and for strontium, the machine heats it up to 8,000 degrees Celsius. So the machines are actually calibrated to do very specific analyses. So we have not yet done the strontium um, because we have to do some sample preparation and we're still gonna, we're gonna have to try to do that this summer. Um, but we have gotten the results back for the carbon and the nitrogen and oxygen, but I'm just going to talk about the carbon nitrogen today. So what does the carbon uh, tell us? We can answer questions about different diets based on the photosynthetic pathways of the plants themselves. So a high percentage of carbon-13 um, the delta-13 indicates a diet high in C4 plants or tropical grasses. So that would be like, like sugar cane uh, or corn, maize. And a low percentage of the, the delta-13 carbon indicates a diet high in C3 plants or more temperate grasses. Uh, wheat has sort of a, a in-between signature. So it's it's got C3 um, in the leaves, but then it has, uh, sorry, it has C4 in the, the, the leaves and then C3 in the seeds of the, the kernel, which is what is ground up for our bread. So a high percentage of nitrogen is consistent with a diet rich in marine protein, whereas a low percentage is consistent with more terrestrial protein consumption. So the first Anthropological studies here are going to be looking at the carbon and nitrogen. Um, and the very first ones that were done were based on carbon when trying to figure out the diets of our hominin ancestors. And the nitrogen is useful for talking about the proteins that are consumed. So the ratios are able to roughly characterize whether the population was consuming more terrestrial or more aquatic protein. And in a revealing study by Bethard and colleagues, they were able to determine that the population in Peru, that although it was close to the Pacific Ocean, um, they were not actually ingesting large amounts of marine protein. And so this is obviously relevant to the question here at Antioquia as it's right by the, the Mediterranean Sea. So one would expect a certain profile to surface. Oxygen isotopes are useful in examining movements within and between populations. This isotope is location specific and is incorporated into the dentition while the teeth are forming, but it may differ from the signals that are received in the skeletal tissues, which are again being turned over in life. So differences between these levels in teeth and bone can indicate whether there's migration. So as with the oxygen isotope strontium, is also useful in assessing the residential mobility. The key here is that the strontium is leached into the groundwater. And as we walk through these levels of consumption, humans drink the water, but also eat the plants that grew from this water. And also the animals that also ate the plants that drank the same water. So with the cremated remains, there's very little organic elements left. Only the strontium may be available for study. So we hope to prepare these cremated samples this summer. For our materials and methods presented today, uh, the samples were submitted include seven human individuals, six of those are the adults and then the one infant. And there were only uh, including small sample sizes. So roughly one centimeter and in, in cubed. Um, so four human non-animals are analyzed for carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. The samples were collected in sterile glass vials and mailed to the lab with the permission of the museum curation. Also, thank you to Nisa for all of her help in translation and, and being the intermediate between um, laboratories and myself and Emily. So all, uh, all analyses were completed at the Mamara Research Center, Earth and Marine Sciences Institu Institute of Tubitak. And the collagen was extracted from the bone samples via, via ultrafiltration. Additionally, we have 40 samples of cremated remains that we're submitting for strontium. So here are the results. So we've got increasing nitrogen here and 
it's increasing in the carbon ratios this direction, but we've got non-human, human, human, so they're labeled as such. So seven human individuals, six adults and one infant and four non-human are analyzed for carbon and nitrogen in this graph. The mean delta carbon value for the humans is negative 18.83, which is higher than that of the non-humans, which is negative 20, mostly due to one human from the small bath having a high value. The mean delta nitrogen value for humans is 8.49, and this is higher for that of the, the non-humans and the small bath having a higher value than the Acropolis individuals and the infant having the highest value. So the infant is up here at the top. But here we've got small bath, small bath, Acropolis, and then necropolis individual here. So what does this tell us? So in conclusion, there's evidence of breastfeeding with the infant ratio being so high, and that's consistent with previous research on, on uh, how breastfeeding is presented in the ratios. And interestingly, there appears to be cultural variation in the diet for the older samples at the Acropolis uh, compared to the temple, having a more plant-based diet, which are closely associated with the Roman and the Byzantine artifacts. And this is compared to the individuals buried haphazardly in the ruins of the small bath, which represent individuals with diets more rich in fish and meat. So notably, these are the burials that are more closely associated with the cache of coins, which are likely from more seafaring people. But we need to be able to uh, analyze the carbon dating to get a better picture of this. Um, and DNA could also be a value. So in there, and I just want to acknowledge uh, Mehmet and Terhan for help with the samples and the processing uh, for the analysis. Um, at the University of Nebraska, of course, we want to thank Dr. Michael Hoff and Nisa and Serap had both done some translations with getting these samples submitted. Um, and our other colleagues at Antioquia at Cragham who are presenting all of their interesting, exciting research here today. Also wanna thank all the students. And I know we have a couple of the students who are, are here who have actually helped with the Kimik Takama. So go Kimik Takama. Um, and to the organizers of Ahmed and especially Asena, thank you so much for allowing us to be here. So if there are any questions, and here are some of our references. Yes. I guess I ran out of time, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you so much also for the, the time. And uh, actually you are research to people and we are research to their activities. And because <laughs> of this, your information will also be uh, an answer to many our and question. And uh, maybe also this year, and we can speak together for the everything, for the people, for the findings, for the architectural things. And then we can try to understanding the Antioquia at Kragum's people. And uh, thank you so much, the, Megan. Thank you. And now uh, our colleague, our sixth guest, Ho, uh, is professor of archeology, span history and ancient studies at San Olaf College in Minnesota, USA. Professor Ho has written numerous books and articles on subject ranging, ranging from Hellenistic royal identity to ancient trade and agriculture. He is a co-director of the Antioquia at Kragum Archaeological Research Project, where he oversees the excavate of the Acropolis. Thank you so much, Asana Hanum, for the introduction. Uh, I'd also like to thank the team at Ahmed and Koch University for making this possible. And of course, all my colleagues, especially Michael Hoff, for keeping us all organized and everyone who's presented today. It's just been, been wonderful. So I'm going to talk about the Christian community on the Acropolis from our 2014 through 2019 excavations. So I'll begin. Uh, Christianity took root quickly in Cilicia, partly because of the special attention given the region by the ministries of Paul and Thecla. But despite the region, the religion's problematic status during the third and early fourth centuries with respect to the Roman authorities, the Christian communities of Cilicia thrived during this period. In fact, the cities of Cilicia 
consecrated a number of churches in prominent public spaces. First is temple conversions, and then is new constructions. After the Edict, edict of Milan in 313, uh, and the codification of Christianity as a state-sanctioned religion, church construction only increased. A later wave of large-scale construction occurred in the late 5th and early 6th centuries, spurred by the patronage of the homegrown Isaurian Emperor Zeno. Tim, Antioch sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, do you change your the slides and presentation page? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah, I, I want to be sure. Sorry, I want to be sure. Yeah, no, 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 no problem. No <laughs> so problem. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, no problem. Okay. okay. So, Antiochia was no exception to all of these trends. The Christians of Antiochia invested in large scale public projects in the late third, early fourth century on the city's Acropolis, which you can see here. I'm mentioning here's the Imperial Temple. Um, the Great Bath and the Acropolis here. The Necropolis Megan was just talking about is down here by the water. So just to, just to give you some orientation. Um, Antiochia sent bishops to the major ecumenical gatherings of the day, but unlike her neighbors, both large and small, Antiochia chose to invest in new construction for its churches rather than temple or other structure conversions, which was the norm. And I don't want us to read too much into this. New construction in Antiochia may have been less a conscious decision than a practical one. Shopper's raid in the middle of the third century caused significant damage to Antiochia. And from this disaster, I think was born opportunity. In rebuilding following Shopper's incursion, Antiochia's Christian community built their first basilica church the first baptistry and an Episcopal palace. And, 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 and keeping uh, the recent violence well in mind, the Antiochians turned to the Acropolis, a, a steep ridge the south of the Great Bath in the city center that they leveled and terraced to accommodate the new structures. The first of these is a small basilica-sized church, basilic-style church uh, with a connected baptistry. And although we'll hear from Asana uh, that the refinement of the pottery chronology is still ongoing, the ceramics from foundation trenches in both the narthex and the apse of the Basilica Church suggest a pre-edict of Milan date, late third, very early fourth century. While the building plan of the first uh, basilica has been obscured and partially demolished by the construction of the second basilica in the fifth century, the apse the main nave and the narthex are clearly visible. The narthex is particularly well preserved because it was repurposed as the foundation uh, and the steps for the narthex of its successor structure, the fifth century Basilica Church. The foundation of the apse is also well preserved with radiating walls to the north and to the south that suggest pastophoria. Painted plaster remains from the destruction deposits found in the remains of the apse suggest that the walls of the nave and the apse were richly decorated in solid colors. And as we'd expect, red and black dominate the fragments, but there's also light green and yellow present. As yet, no designs, texts, or figures have been uncovered, only swaths of primary colors. Like so many buildings in the region, the first Basilica Church ended its life in an earthquake. Perhaps the Great Quake of 462 that destroyed Isaurian Antioch, though there are many possible contenders. As we've seen just recently, this is a geologically active region. The mid fifth century witnessed a number of large earthquakes that caused widespread damage across rough Cilicia, such as the one that hit Seleucia in 458. Adjoining the first Basilica Church is a baptistry, largely circular in shape, um, though the western side is poorly preserved, the result of multiple modifications over time and the cataclysm that brought an end to the structures on the Acropolis in the ninth century. In its present configuration, the baptistry was entered from the west with brick steps mortared in place to provide access. The walls and the floor of the structure were waterproofed in a three to four centimeter layer of opus signinum. 
the outer surface of which was painted a vivid red. Like the adjoining Basilica Church, the baptistry was very simply decorated in, pla in painted plaster without the mosaics or marble finishes seen in contemporary structures elsewhere in the region. This conforms to a general trend among the early Christian structures on the Athenian Acropolis. All consistently lack adornment, and the builders seem to have been more interested in function rather than aesthetics. To the south of the Basilica churches is a large two-story, two-roomed rectilinear structure right here on your screen, with large ashlar blocks of fine limestone. As the largest building on the Antiochian Acropolis yet found, this structure has a commanding presence. It could see everything and be seen from everywhere. Such prominent placement was the norm for bishops' residences in Asia Minor. As Sardi in her 2020 article notes, an Episcopal palace on the city's Acropolis proclaimed to all the bishop's leadership. And yet, just like the baptistry and the First Basilica Church, this building stands out for its lack of aesthetic additions. Unlike many Episcopal palaces in the region, the rectilinear structure on the Antiochian Acropolis is simply adorned with simple plaster floors that contain no trace of mosaic or marble insets and unpainted walls, or at least we have not yet found any remnants of plaster, painted plaster. Unlike the nearby churches and baptistry, we just don't have the plaster on the walls at all surviving. Nonetheless, the building is clearly marked as a Christian space. On the interior wall, to the left and right of the doorway, there are large stones here and here with inscribed crosses. In fact, this here has 12 different inscribed crosses, largely conforming to these two on this that I've marked out in red here. Uh, sorry. The other uh, interesting feature above the doorway was found where was placed this a large monumental cross, a monumental inscribed cross. And it proclaimed, I think, the building's purpose to anybody who can see it. The symbols of the Christian faith set the structure apart and suggest uh, formal ecclesiastical use. So do the walkway linking the Episcopal Palace and the nearby Basilica. You can see some steps coming up. There's a plaster walkway that joined this doorway and later structures have cut into it, and there's a robber's trench in here that cut into it. But like so many things, the Christians at, at Antiochia, they've put their own spin. They've stressed the austere rather than the luxurious. The Episcopal Palace has one large doorway, which opens to the north, uh, providing access to the narthex and the Basilica Church, Outside the doorway, the thick mortared surface connects the palace's entrance with the narthex and the, of the first and second basilica churches. This surface was cut, as I said, with, a, with, with a later additions and a robber's trench. The entrance to the Episcopal Palace, as you see here in the slide, is large and well built with fine monolithic limestone door jams, threshold, and lintel. To ensure security, the entrance had slots cut in both, si both the sides and the floors of the doorway to receive locking bars. Once inside, visitors entered into a formal foyer that contained a set of stairs going up and a doorway that opened into the main room to the left. Both the foyer and the main room had rectangular 15 to 20 centimeter windows to allow light and air. Into the, into the structure, and there were support holes to accommodate beams for an upper floor that this staircase led to. Unlike the First Basilica Church and the Baptistry, the dating of the Episcopal Palace has been difficult. Two clusters of pottery were found, suggesting construction dates contemporary with both the Council of Nicaea in 325 and the Council of Chalcedon in 451. 
the destruction of the first basilica church and the construction of the second basilica church in the fifth century suggest a possible solution to this chronological spread. I would like to suggest that the two clusters of pottery represent the initial construction and a later repair or remodel undertaken at the same time as the Antiochians built the larger three-aisled basilica in the mid-fifth century. Both of these dates make sense in a wider cultural frame, time frame as well, as there are times when the church leaders of Antiochia participated in the major ecumenical discourses of power in the region. One could easily see Bishop Antonius consecrating an Episcopal palace after his first of his participation in the first official church council recognized by the imperial government at Nicaea in 325, and Bishop Akakius doing the same in 451. Consecrating an Episcopal palace would be an important step in communicating both the changed status of the local Christian community within the politics of the Roman state, as well as the importance of the Antiochian bishop within the wider Christian hierarchy. More to the point, these dates, the early fourth to the mid-fifth centuries, fit the wider historical context for when bishops throughout Asia Minor began to invest in formal public residences. Like all the Christian structures on the Antiochian Acropolis, the Episcopal Palace ended in cataclysm, likely brought on by a major earthquake. A fine layer of ash uh, covers uh, and uh, with roof tiles and carbonized beams was uncovered in the main room and in the entry chamber. The pottery from the Vern layer date to the ninth century. The same era as the destruction levels of the nearby second basilica. It's tempting to link this widespread destruction, which brought an end to the formal ecclesiastical activity on the Antiochian Acropolis, to the massive earthquake of 859, whose epicenter was off the coast of Cilicia in the Gulf of Antioch. Because it coincides with the last, with the term of the last known bishop, Theophanes. At present, though, there's just not enough data to link this formal abandonment of the Acropolis to any specific earthquake. I don't know if we ever will be able to do that. I want to turn now to the second basilica here on your screen. In the second half of the fifth century, the Antiochians constructed a larger, more extensive structure to replace the one destroyed by earthquake. This new church was a three-aisled basilica, typical of the churches built in the region during that period, with an apse flanked by pastophoria on the east and a large narthex on the west. Unlike the late 3rd, early 4th century basilica church which preceded it, this much larger 5th century basilica church was shifted off the true east-west axis slightly to the north in order to accommodate the northeast-southwest spine of rock that forms the Acropolis of Antiochia. Even with this shift, though, a significant amount of terracing and foundation work was required, especially on the eastern end, to accommodate the slope of the hill and allow the narthex, nave, and apse to be on the same level. As a result, the apse wall is over five meters high, from foundation to the part that still survives, while the narthex is less than two meters high to achieve a level surface. And the central section of the nave in here had to be cut out of bedrock. So two meters to build up here, five meters to build up here, and the rock had to be cut out here. And yet there were many benefits to this construction. The high wall of the apse allowed for an enclosed interior staircase to lead down to a large crypt. It gave access to a small entry room here and then stairs to go into the crypt. As you can see here, entryway coming down, down into the crypt. A fortified pier here, and recycled monolith column here. The column has fallen off to the side. These formed the floor, the, super, the, the superstructure of the floor, and it was paved by these large stones 
robbed from the main road down in the city center. The nave floor plaster contains no trace of mosaic or marble fragments. In fact, the only workable marble found in the building, apart from the spolia in the walls and the steps, come from the remains of a chancel screen, which were found together where they fell immediately above and commingled with the burn layer of the crypt. Also found in this layer were red, black, and green plaster fragments, suggesting that this basilica had interior decorations similar to its predecessor. Typical of the period, the center of the nave is pierced by a window to the north, with a small side door leading down to the northern pastaforia and to the baptistry here. Beyond the doorway, a series of reused roadway stones form these large, broad steps. The main entrance to the church, though, is here in the narthex which had a barrel vault ceiling, which still had plaster remains to it. Unfortunately, this was destroyed in a lightning strike in 2016. A cistern built in the eastern wall of the apse over here supplied water to the church and like the nearby Episcopal Palace. Unfortunately, the ninth century earthquake, which ended the structures on the Christian Acropolis, caused the upper walls of the apse and the majority of the cistern to collapse into the ravine. As a result, the extent of the cistern and its access points and supporting infrastructure are now impossible to recover. As typical in Cilician churches of this period, the building contains numerous marble spolia taken from older monuments located in the lower city. Apart from the road stones used for the apse floor and the side stairs, fine marble column bases, sections of architrave, carved moldings and blocks can be seen throughout embedded in walls of the church. Here, here, and there's several others here and over here. These were aesthetic rather than structural. As Sardi notes in her important study on spolia in ecclesiastical contexts, incorporating spolia into buildings was more problematic than utilizing new building materials and required greater technical skill to maintain the integrity of the structure, despite the different sizes and makeups of its materials. The fact that the Antiochians chose to use these spolia for aesthetic rather than structural purposes is underscored that the spolia were not used for their original purposes. That is, the Antiochians chose to use this column base here in the entrance, not as a column base. And instead, the column bases were made out of the native Acropolis stone of schist and schisty marble. These fine white marble spolia would be instantly recognizable among the green and, green and brown schist blocks that make up the structure. Moreover, the second basilica is the only structure on the Acropolis to incorporate spolia. Spolia are markedly absent from the Episcopal Palace, the Baptistry, and the remaining portion of the third early fourth century Basilica Church. So the incorporation of spolia into the fifth century church especially the visible spolia in the walls of the nave, the narthex, and the side stairs was a purposeful act and departed from previous practice. Here again, Sardi offers critical context, observing that Christian communities use spolia as a way to commemorate not only Christianity's triumph over traditional religion and traditional culture, but also the Roman political, social, and cultural achievements of the deep past. So by deploying spolia in Christian spaces, Christian communities commemorated their Romanness, their links to the past, literally built upon them. The spolia act as a physical metaphor to represent the way Christianity was built on classical pagan Rome. The end for the Second Basilica Church and formal Christian worship on the Acropolis came via a massive earthquake in the ninth century. The five meter supporting wall of the apse and the crypt together with most of the upper parts of the structure 
collapsed into the ravine, as evidenced by the fact that there were very few roof tiles found in the architectural remains. The only, carbon, the only carbonized remains are the support beams, the support column, and the repurposed roadstones from the apse floor were preserved in the ruins of the crypt. Probably because the heavy roadstones trapped the supports beneath them when they fell. In this destruction layer, alongside the roadstones, we found glass shards, clearly from a, a chandelier, bronze wick holders, fragments of bronze chain, likely the remains of the chandeliers in the main level. Beneath the roadstones in the burn and ash layer were found 10 lamps of differing styles dating from the 6th through the 9th centuries. The lamps here from the 800s give us a terminus antiquem for the use of the crypt, uh, the early 800s, I should say. Antiochia ad Crancum already had a rough, I'm sorry, a rough, uh, robust and active Christian community at the time Constantine issued the Edict of Milan in 313. The city was not only confident and established enough to have sent a bishop to the First Council of Nicaea in 325, but to also to have built a basilica, an Episcopal palace, and a baptistry. In fact, that the Christians of Antiochia had the resources and the local goodwill to build clearly marked Christian structures on the most visible place in the city, the Acropolis, suggests that their standing in the community and the general comfort they felt in practicing their religion openly. And this Christian community only grew in strength and confidence over time. By the fifth century, the Antiochians built a new, much larger, more established three hour basilica church in the ruins of the earlier structure. Here they placed the spolia, as I mentioned, taken from the city's older monuments in the walls and in the entry points, so that they could link the new structures to the city's classical past and at the same time create their own new traditions and identities. Over the course of six seasons of excavation, the Acropolis of Antiochia ad Kragum has given us a window into the architectural and cultural history of Christianity during a pivotal period in the religion's development. The evidence for Christian worship that comes from the Acropolis demonstrates that the inhabitants of Antiochia were every bit as civically engaged and, and as resilient as their classical predecessors. They proudly adorned the high places of their city with the symbols of their faith and came together to rebuild the monuments on an even grander scale in the face of what must have been a devastating natural disaster. They built a shining city on the hill. I have no doubt that further excavation will only deepen our understanding of this important period and raise new questions about the nature of Christianity and Christian interactions with non-Christians in rough Cilicia. I want to thank you all and especially thank our students who helped us find and uncover all of this. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Professor, Professor Ho. And the uh, Acropolis is also a very exciting part of the city and for me, especially for me, because the ceramic finds as very different, different kind of uh, the pottery came from the Acropolis and also I'm particularly excited about the domestic area actually and uh, we will see uh, the, the about the pottery uh, as I said before I'm so exciting you have two questions but we will uh, ask the question the end of the the second part because of this and uh, for now thank you so much uh, professor ho and uh, also your working and your presentation yes now uh, it's my turn <laughs> and uh, i will share before uh, my screen Okay. 
Uh, allow me to give a short information also about myself. Uh, I graduated with the PhD at Erzurum Atatürk University, Department of Archaeology, with a thesis title is on for production and trade relations of Eleusa Sebaste at the ancient time. I'm currently teaching at Kastamonu University, where I'm head of the archaeology department and the director of the history, archaeology application and research center. I'm vice director of Eleusa Sebaste excavation and also since uh, 2019, I'm the vice director of the Antioquia at Kragum too. I continue to work as a field coordinator and ceramics at the Kragum, which I have been participating in since 2015. Uh, in this program, I will present to you a preliminary assessment of the ceramic production and important ceramic finds from the Antioquia at Kragum. And uh, I prefer to read the, my presentation text because if I start to speak about the pottery, uh, <laughs> I might want to your all, all days. And because of this, uh, I will read especially my text. As all researchers know, the Cilicia has been an important region in the historical process with its location and resources, especially the cities with ports are at the forefront in terms of production and trade. Antioquia at Kragum is one of the most important cities of rough Cilicia that produce ceramics and especially amphora. Cities of Cilicia produced commercial amphora and ceramic in different forms during the Roman and late Roman periods. We know that especially wine and olive oil produced in the rural settlements were transported to many regions and cities through the port cities within these amphoras. Despite the ceramic kilns dating to the late Roman period in Antioquia at Kragum, no kiln that can be dated to the early Roman period has been identified, apart from the survey data under the direction of the Professor Nicolas Rao conducted in this region. However, this data and ceramic finds show that the city also made production in the Roman period. The kiln detected next to the small bath in the 2022 season seems to give us this evidence. And you can see here is the, the kiln in the small bed, near the small bed. It will be possible to say something clear after the excavation work and the examination of the ceramic data are completed. In the excavation carried out so far, a total of seven ceramic kilns and a single glass furnace have been identified in the sea. The kilns with its grill and profernium intact provide us with very useful information in terms of kiln architecture and technology. It's told that the large kiln with an inner diameter of 3.5 meters, which were identified in 2021, had several stages and was perhaps used as a lime kiln in the late period after ceramic production. And uh, you can see also in this picture, the big one. The glazing that exists on the inner surfaces of the stones that make up the wave of the furnace seems to give an idea about the function of the furnace. Archaeometric studies continue in this regard. And you can see here is the so huge kiln and also with the other kilns. And then also uh, you can see is the vitrification surfaces of the stones and uh, the, this kind of stones start in here and they continue until the end. The most produced amphora from during the Roman period is the forms commonly known as Zimmer 41, which can be distinguished by its penchant handle. This amphora type produced in several different capacities seems to be more preferred, especially the small capacities one. The ANT stamp on its neck must be pointing to Antioquia. The nearby Buchkaji and Siedra workshop were also producing the same form, especially the large capacities version, but without an AT and an ANT stamp. Sorry. Apart from the Zimmer 41 amphora, the ST also produced kitchen and common wares in the same kilns with the same clay. 
When we look at these forms, we were able to determine that certain types were on the forefront and that, that similar ones existed in other cities in region with analogical studies. The pinched handle anchors has been found in a wide geography such as Athens, Corinth, Berenike, Ostia, Pompeii, Israel, Gaza, Egypt, and Sudan. These data give us an idea about the place of cargo in the Mediterranean trading system. The point to be considered is to determine whether the anchor determined by analogical studies will be the production of Eastern Rough or Western Rough Cilicia because the same form produced in the two regions difference in terms of clay and fabric structure. This situation also makes petrographic studies necessary. Work on the Antioquia example is still ongoing. We will publish results as soon as possible. The finds uncovered in recent studies show that the steel also produced a bag-shaped form form known as Agora M273 intensively apart from Zimmer 41. Here you can see the Zimmer 41, it's the, from the Athenian Agora, is Anamurium and the Eleusis Sebaste and Antiochia Kragum. And, and this one is the, the other, the second type of to produce uh, amphoras in Kragum is the uh, back shape. We didn't give the some names, special names, but uh, the, when you check the Agora findings, and you can see Agora M273, and also the, the they think is perfectly matched with the Antioquia Kragum. This form is very similar to the Samos cistern type produced in the later period. We can see example of the Samos cistern type in Siedra, the other city of the region, rather than Kragum. In addition to its similarities with the Zimmer 41 in form, it differs with its back shape body, all section handle and the bottom feature. And also you can see the Samos cistern type is similar with the, the others. The sea also has the Dressa 2 and 4 produced by Bichkuji and Siedra and the Silicia type 6 form uh, produced by the Siedra. We have not yet been able to detect any, any clear that data that Kragum may have produced these forms. It may be thought that the sea shared a form with Bichkuji and Siedra workshop. It's highly probable that Kragum produced a small capacity Zimmer 41 and other workshop produced a large capacity Dressal 2M4 type 6 and Zimmer 41. According to the first assessment, the city must have started ceramic production towards the end of the first century AD and produced Zimmer 41, one of the typical forms of the period, as well as common wear. The city which recovered itself after the Sassanian attack, it seems to be to have added to Agora M273 form to its produ production repertoire as well as Zimmer 41. The important material of the city until the 4th century AD consisted mainly of Cypress sigillatas. The city even, even produced imitation of the Cypress forms. Apart from these groups, no intensive important material has been encountered yet. The important material from the first century AD uh, are African, proto late Roman one, late Roman one B, and small number of late Roman three, four, and intensively Cypress red slip wear. I will show you uh, here, it's maybe. This one is the second production part. Yes, you can see here is the late Roman one, proto late Roman one, late Roman four, and the Fokea, the Patri. It's all belongs to the, the, the late Roman period in the city. African and Fokea red slip bear, one of the common imported groups of the period, have been found in very, very uh, few numbers for now. The third production period of the city coincides with the period after the 5th century AD. This production must have continued in the 7th century AD. During this period, the 
city produced an amphora for form similar to late Roman one called late Roman 13 in many studies, as well as kitchen and commonware as in the Roman period. When we look at the typological and analogical studies of the form, it's known that it was produced in the 8th century AD. However, we have not able to clarify this issue yes, yet as the excavation continue, whether Kragum produced in the 8th century AD. The kiln representing this period of the city are located in the Great Bath. The furnace, the glass furnace found next to the bath and draw to have been producing after the 4th century AD. Also documents that this area was turned into a production area. The other group pottery identified in the city is the glazed pottery uh, dated between the 11th and 13th century AD. The glazed, we can see here, yes. And the glazed and sgraffito ceramic finds, which were identified in small numbers, are a clue about the late period use of the sea or its surroundings. The new excavations and finding evolution studies that are planned to continue in Antioquia at Kragum in the coming years will undoubtedly provide new data to support or at least complement the hypothesis put forward in this presentation regarding the ceramic material and the will elucidate the problems awaiting solution. Thank you for interest. And then uh, actually I read <laughs> a little fastly and sometimes I missed some of the, the pictures and uh, maybe I can explain if someone, some audience uh, ask me question. And then you can see in these pictures, it's the, especially for the, the production by the Kragum, the patries, and also some the, the other kind of the patries came from the, this other regions. Yes, thank you so much. And now, and our last guest in Michael Hof, who is actually the host, <laughs> and the most important person of this big project. And I want to give to some information also about him. Michael Love is professor of art history in the Department of Art History at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, where he has been on the faculty since 1989. He received his graduate in art history and archaeology from the University of Missouri, master degree in classical from Florida State University, and his PhD in art history from Boston University. Hoff specializes in Greek and Roman archaeology, in which he has focused his research on the history of Roman Athens, as well as the archaeology of Asia Minor. He has excavated in North Wales in Greece in the Athenian over a Corinth grid and the sanctuary of Zeus at Nemea. In Turkey, he co-directed the archaeological survey team of the Rock Silesia Archaeological Survey project from 1997 to 2004 and since 2005, serves as project director at the Antioquia Kragum excavation. Yes, Michael. Thank you so much also for now. Um, let's see, what is sharing? That's not the right one. Um, you can choose your page, the PowerPoint page. Well, thank you, everybody. Asana Tarkhan owes for this um, marvelous opportunity for the research team at Antiochia to be able to present some of the fruits of our um, research over the past, well, almost over 15 years now. 
Um, I'm not sure if it was mentioned, but we are in the process. This is for all of you uh, listeners out there that we are in the process of putting together an uh, a uh, an interim report that is meant to um, highlight our first 15 years, although it add a few more years on that. Uh, we are putting the book together. Uh, the papers are coming in. They are being edited. It will be published by uh, Oxbow Press out of Oxford, hopefully in the um, next calendar year, if we can get um, people to uh, finish submitting their, their papers, uh, it would be, uh, anyway, it'll be, a, it'll be a, a wonderful thing as we get this, uh, our, the, the, the uh, research uh, disseminated. Um, my talk this afternoon or evening, I guess, as it is for you all, is a little bit different. I'm kind of interested now in some of the reports of the early travelers. And as I was listening to several of the talks, I was struck by how a lot of what I'm going to be talking about will tie into uh, to various folks' research. So uh, let's um, let's go ahead and and start. Um, the talk, my talk has to do with the early visitors, uh, which is interesting because where does the early visitors, I probably should have said the early modern visitors to the site, um, because where does it begin with relation to the end of occupation at the site, um, which is um, an intriguing thing. I was just listening to um, Tim Howe's talk about the uh, the occupation periods of the Acropolis um, that seems to indicate a possible ninth century um, terminus. Uh, and Asena's pottery dates that are beginning to also show some uh, middle Byzantine um, periods of occupation and that and we're beginning to, and we're finding little pockets of Byzantine pottery around the site. So it, it appears that there is probably some level of, occupation at the site. Um, uh, Tim Howe is talking about the ninth century, and it, it so happens that the uh, the very last name associated with Antiochia Kragum is the Bishop Theophanes, who is recorded at having participated in the eighth Ecumenical Council at Constantinople that occurred in 879 and 880. So could he have been a, an occupant in the bishop's palace that Tim has identified at the crest of the Acropolis? It's very possible. Uh, if we look at that palace I just bring in, this is a body that we found a while back. I'm not saying that this is uh, Bishop Theophanes, but he was probably, this this guy buried here is probably an important figure uh, in the among the ecclesiastical set, uh, the Christian set who occupied up here. Why not have this guy be one of the bishops? Uh, we haven't done carbon-14 Yet on this guy, we were planning to be doing that uh, in the um, in the coming months. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, maybe put a you know a, a better uh, understanding of some of these datable materials to uh, to work with the architectural forms. So um, if we have a sort of a gradual halt to um, organized habitation 
up here in the, whether it be at the Acropolis or further below around the site. Uh, as we're finding out, thanks to um, to Asena's work, is that there does seem to be some pottery that may date as late as um, after the turn of the millennium. So after 1000, maybe to 1300, it is within that time frame that we're pretty certain that the uh, that the region would be uh, would receive the first Seljuk um, uh, occupiers. So we have a uh, removal of Byzantine authority at some point during this time frame, and the arrival of the first Turkic speaking peoples. Did the arrival of the Seljuk people have a role in the uh, in the final occupation of the site? We don't know. Uh, we're hoping that information will become uh, will become available as we as we continue. Um, okay, so let's assume that the um, that there's no more occupation going on here, except for maybe these these pockets. Maybe there's a house or two that fields are perhaps still under some cultivation. Um, but if the there's no occupation in the upper site, still the the area around the site is still known, is still being utilized. And particularly, I'm talking about um, the harbor down below. Um, we have a um, Byzantine source in the middle of the 10th century, 949, in fact, tells us that Antiochia e Micra, basically meaning small Antioch, that is in comparison to big Antioch, Antioch on the Orontes, is serving as a base for ships that are guarding the Isaurian coast. And only a little while later, here out in, and we are finding out here in the harbor uh, anchors that belong to Byzantine ships uh, during various surveys that Akanoniz has uh, has um, has done. We've been able to find anchors that date from the Bronze Age through the Rome in Roman period, Byzantine period, Ottoman period. So. This was a, uh, a a hopping place. This uh, this anchorage, if not the site up above, you can see. In fact, it, up here, the uh, the top of the Acropolis, and then the harbor down below with the Byzantine period anchors. A very interesting thing happened in the very beginning of the 12th century. That in 1103, an English pilgrim to Jerusalem, uh, who was in fact a crusader, who was named Cywulf, kept a journal on his homeward bound return. And he records that after he departed Cyprus, he arrived at Antiochia Parva, again, small Antioch, where his ship was attacked by pirates. And so, as I was listening to Megan's uh, talk just a few minutes ago, where she's talking about mm, potentially seaborne people being buried rather, or I should say deposited rather haphazardly inside of the small bath, made me think that, well, maybe there's um, potential correlation. Um, so it's really going to be interesting when we receive the uh, the carbon fourteen dates. So eleven oh three, we have a British uh, visitor to the site. Maybe he didn't climb up the top of the hill, but he certainly was down in the harbor. Just a few years later, we have a Russian, a Russian abbot named Daniel who visited, and he called the the site. Malia Antiochia, the small Antioch in Russian. And there are, in fact, several other notices of visitors that had come to the site in the 
um, during this same time frame between 1200 and 13, 1400. Um, keep in mind, we're not talking about climbing up to the hill, but rather utilizing the harbor as a waypoint. Now, we have already made mention of the fact that the uh, that the harbor and really the uh, the the cliff face and and uh, along with the the antique Kragos appear to have been probably maritime signposts, rather uh, significant maritime elements that would have made it into the nautical charts. Well, even as early as the classical Hellenistic period um, and well into the um, the Roman period. And, uh, but I'm sorry, I had this thing, pirates. I can't, uh, we can't seem to get around um, pirates operating on our, on our seacoast. The, um, the, the point is, is that the, the harbor at Antiochia seems to have been a major focal point in the nautical charts. So I said, at, at least as early as the classical period uh, and well into the Hellenistic period, because it keeps popping up in the, in, the, um, in the maritime reports in antiquity. And it would continue to do so into or throughout the medieval and early modern periods, um, especially in the form of Portland charts. Um, Portland charts were a... Um, uh, were kind of maps in a way, but or rather charts that are meant to show the relative location of ports and harborages all along principally the Mediterranean and Black Sea coast. These seem to um, to date, um, especially for the Mediterranean from the 13th century on. Um, they were pulled, created from Byzantine charts, which themselves were uh, were based upon uh, Roman charts. This is, in fact, um, one of the the earliest um, chart that we have here in the United States at the United States Smithsonian, a Genoese. Portland chart dating to the very early part of the 14th century, and it uh, it looks rather complicated, uh, but you can see basically in an abstract way the outline of the Mediterranean. Uh, here we are in the East Coast. Over here, down is Egypt. Over here is Cyprus. These. Uh, these centrifugal points appear to be areas where um, where compass readings can be held. So you can see that uh, this was before the the Mercator lines were were invented, but mainly meant to provide um, uh, li not lines of sight so much, but uh, of magnetic various magnetic headings. Uh, when we show a detailed view of the area between um, Cyprus and then the coast of uh, of Cilicia, which I bring you here, now I've sort of shifted the vantage point. So I'm down below is east and up to the top is west. And keep in mind that the majority of these Portland charts are Italian in origin. This particular one is also is, is Genoese. But here is, in red, is the bastardization of Antioch, uh, Antiochia, uh, and above is the, the Lombardo, which is um, Salinas. Uh, so it was, even though the site is not occupied, the harborage is permanently placed upon the uh, the the memory, I should say, of the of the the sailors who ply the Mediterranean. Which brings us now to the small bath, which we've talked about on several occasions now, that um, where we had the deposits of the coin hoard. 
that we were, and Megan and I were just talking about this in the chat in, during the last few minutes, where we found in the in 2018 this magnificent hoard of early modern coins dating to uh, the beginning of the 17th century, just to give you a smattering of the coins, which have now all been cleaned and are um, yet to be fully studied. But an examination of many of the readable European coins seems to locate this uh, the date in the uh, around the 18 uh, I'm sorry the 1620s. So what were they doing up here? Well, this appears to be very likely a place that the coins were secreted by yet again a visitor. Uh, up to the site, who found who who recognized the the small bath as a place in a deserted area with ruins and rather uh, pl a rather nice hidey hole uh, where he could secrete his uh, his treasure, whether it was gainfully made or ungainfully made, as the case may be deposited only never to uh to return again so um the uh let's now move ahead we don't really know what happens when my research assistant is acting up hey get down uh pardon the interruption uh, let's not, we don't know very much that happens in between the early 17th century and the early uh, 18th century um, until the time of uh, Sir Francis Beaufort, uh, an Irishman who had been, uh, who was a, uh, a commander of a ship of the line and for the British Admiralty was uh, passed or ordered by the Admiralty to survey the the south coast of um, the Mediterranean and Aegean coast, I should point out. Uh, and so he traveled along the coast, as we know, and he was uh, among the very first, well, now maybe not so much, he's no longer the first Western visitor. Maybe that was our friend Sywolf from way back in the 12th century. But he was the first one to identify this as an ancient site. Uh, and um, Beaufort was, of course, known not so much, I mean, he's known to us rather as the inventor of the Beaufort wind scale, uh, a scale that sailors from all over the world use to um, to classify the force of winds, but in his younger days, he was a, uh, a a commander of the British line, and he was also a, a an amateur classicist, and he used the opportunity that was given to him to um, to chart the coastline. And and his charting would be used, in fact, to create or to write a book uh, in which we have for the first time evidence of the um, of the ancient remains of the sites along the coast of Asia Minor. Uh, and you can see the original published in 1817 and reprinted in 2014. How, I would become very interested in learning more about Francis Beaufort, and I discovered that his journals, his, his the actual journals that he wrote while on voyage, um, are kept within the collections of the Huntington Library in Pasadena, California, which is home to Disneyland. Not that there's a correlation between the two. Um, so I got a virtual appointment to take a look at these journals, uh, which I have out here in front of you. And I point out that in his book, if we can just go back for a second, in his book, he says that 
we came, we next came to the ruins of an ancient town, which I apprehend must have been the Antiochia ad Kragum of Pompey. So when we look at his actual journals, we note that on the his his day-to-day -day diaries are on the right side of the page. Things that he filled in later, um, perhaps even much later, several years later, as he's preparing his manuscript, he wrote on the left side of the page. And here, if you notice, he writes down Antiochia Epicrago Ptolemy. So it, and we know from our later visitors who came to the site, antiquarians, archaeologists, they always refer back to Beaufort uh, by calling this Antiochia ad Kragum. And so this little line that we have here on the page is the um, cause for the traffic signs that we see on the D400 uh, even today. Now, what did Beaufort carry with them? Well, his uh, book tells us, his journals tells us that, that Danville makes a plan uh, by calling it Antiochetta ad Kragum. So when we, I found out that the plan of, uh, of Danville is this one right here. This is the, the map that he had with him when he sailed on the coast. And you will notice that the um, area is just like derived from the Portland charts. Here is Antiochetta, still taking the Italian name for it um, and placed between Salinas and Caradrith to the side. So um, it is Beaufort and his dependence on the Portland charts of the past. This is the map that he then creates in his uh, book. Now, he, while, he was, uh, while he was in the various harbors and anchorages, he, what, he did some sketching and some watercolor sketching. And I know, and he did one of them for Salinas. And I'm wondering if he did one for Antiochia. I have an appointment with Huntington Library for next week. So I hope to be able to discover some more interesting nuggets about our early visitor. Now, it so happens that Beaufort had with him uh, a 24-year-old individual that he had just picked up a few days earlier, um, Charles Cockerell, who would later go on to become one of the great architects of the uh, of the 19, early 19th century in Britain, but he was also an antiquarian. In fact, he was responsible for um, the removal um, of the marbles at the Temple of Aphi on Aegina, as well as those from the Temple of Apollo at Bassi, some of the great monuments of, of ancient Greece. Uh, that was Cockerell. But he came along with Beaufort and uh, he too wrote a book of his exploits uh, that would be published much later in the early 20th century by his son, even though he had uh, made the journey almost a century earlier. And what we learned from this passage was that Beaufort himself wasn't interested in making the, the climb from the harbor all the way up to the top uh, instead, the young cockerel, he's 24 years old, he's a kid, so he's going to go bounding up the, the, um, the road, probably taking the same road that we have now to get down to the, uh, to the harbor, uh, and may have been on the spot where the ancient road was located, and so he was the first Westerner to visit the site that we know of anyway, at least record it, you know, except for that pirate who deposited his coins a few centuries earlier. So he said, um, I, hoping for something more considerable, went up the mountain, and a very rough climb it was. I was, however, well paid for my exertions. I found there numbers of granite columns, marble blocks, and pedestals, and the ruins of a vast and magnificent edifice 
which might have been a Senate house or a gymnasium. The situation of it was truly sublime and must have had a glorious effect from the sea. Uh, he was probably looking at the remains of the Great Bath, which, as you know, are pretty extraordinary, and that's what he was able to see. Uh, he wanted to continue um, taking a look at the whole site, but he had to get back down uh, because Beaufort wanted to move on to get to Onamore before a certain date. Uh, so he wasn't able to explore any further. Then came uh, the later villager, uh, later visitors, Haberday and Wilhelm, the Germans who came in the uh, in the late 19th century, and they also mention or refer back to Beaufort's Antiochia ad Kragum, uh, and they are the next visitors to the site, um, and they're more interested with on um with recording not the architecture so much but the uh but the inscriptions and it was their landmark work on the inscriptions of not just antiochia but much of rough cilicia that also brought the great epigraphers uh george bean and terence mitford to the site uh here's a photograph of them in fact from the uh from the early 1960s where they are in the company of the uh, headmaster, who's not identified, of the Lycee in Ghazi Pasha. Uh, so at least we now can put faces to names. And we are grateful to Bean and Mitford's work in identifying many of the inscriptions um, and to some degree, the architecture as, um, as well. Finally, uh, the this the explorations early visitors to the site um cannot be complete without mentioning elizabeth rosenbaum and her uh magnificent survey of western rough cilicia that was also done in the uh in the early 60s and so in fact the two uh figures rosenbaum and bean and mitford uh working independent of each other, uh, but in some degrees um, coordinated. Um, Rosenbaum, in fact, purposely did not record any inscriptions because that was within the uh, the employ of Bean and Mitford. But her report really uh, from the um, uh, from the late 1960s, um, set the tone and really was the uh, the Bible for those of us who then began surveying here in the 1990s uh, under the um, the direction of Nicholas Rao, and we are the offshoot of of that project. And um, but our ancestor really in the study of Ref Cilicia is Elizabeth Rosenbaum. And we can trace our lineage all the way back down um, to Haberday and Wilhelm, to Cockerell, to Beaufort, and um, even to Cywolf in the uh, early 12th century. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you again for the really great symposium that we've uh, just had. Oh, I have my final slide. Uh, last year's visitor to the site. Okay. We can't hear you, S.A. Okay. Asenanam, ah, Buyrun. Okay. Yes, I'm so, so sorry. I lost. Okay. Can you hear me now? I think. Yes. Thank you very much for 
uh, your reliable information, Michael. Uh, of course, the research done before starting the excavation of a city is as reliable as that work. And this information you conveyed has provided us with uh, very reliable information also for the region. And uh, working with you has always been pleasure for me and of course with everyone on the uh, team too. And I think we had a very nice Antiochate Kragum day. And uh, I apologize for my presentation being so quick. And <laughs> I think it's the effect of being a moderator. And But I feel comfortable as I will present all the ceramic data in the soon to publish the book and the, in the publication I aim to prepare afterwards. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank again Ahmed and Professor Ostekin, Tarkan Kahya and uh, Amrullah Cham and all participants and uh, audience. And uh, everyone who listen to present presentations is welcome to Antioch at Kragum and this year. Okay, so uh, I think I will uh, speak at the end of this uh, meeting. So um, uh, thank you, Asin Hanım. Uh, dear uh, audience, uh, we have come to the end of our meeting, and uh, I would like to thank again uh, Michael Hoff, uh, director of the excavations, uh, and uh, our colleagues, and the, the team of Antioquia who shared their uh, research on the on the site, and they took us uh, on a journey to Antioquia. So I really enjoyed uh, myself. I learned uh, a lot. Uh, I hope you too. So uh, I wish the excavation team a good and a successful work in the, in the uh, coming seasons as well, and hope to be uh, together again in, in another event, perhaps at Ahmed, I don't know. So uh, I think this is our, uh, the second event which we uh, came together. It was uh, in a webinar, uh, archaeology webinar. Uh, I know Michael, Michael Hall from this uh, event. So um, thank you everyone uh, who is with us today and hope to be together uh, at another event and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of everybody. Thank you for all. Thank all you. Your, all well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and great to see everybody. Thank you. Are we done? Yes, we can. We can okay. go. And thank you to all the visitors out there if you're still around. There's 30. Okay. Yes, actually, we have some questions, but with the time is oh. that maybe. <laughs> 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 okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Bye bye, folks. See you, Dennis. See you, Dennis.